Okay, hello, 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 hello. I'm really hoping that this is functioning. F functioning? Functioning, normally. Um, fingers crossed. Anyway, I feel really low, like, like in the bottom of the, uh, the screen, like a little gremlin. But, hello. It's a little later than I would normally be doing the streams, both in time and in date. Unfortunately, I literally just got back from Glastonbury yesterday so i haven't really been able to do the stream at least not while i was there so today was the first day i could do it so thank you so much everyone for your patience in that and yeah i figured i'd better do a november live stream before the end of november considering it's like the 26th of november where has the year gone i actually don't know and uh, <laughs> it's kind of scary because it's like already basically December. Okay. Hello, everyone. Let's see where everyone is from. We've got Germany, USA, Maryland, Florida, Pennsylvania, Finland, Romania, Hungary, London, Columbus, Croatia. Wow. Why did I sound like, um, is his name Owen Wilson? <laughs> Wow. Um, Washington, California, Ohio. There's people from everywhere. Barcelona, Denmark, Chicago, Wolverhampton, Texas, Alaska, Georgia, Utah. I love Glastonbury bookshops. I do as well. And I have, what is my hair doing? I have just gotten a lot of books from the Glastonbury bookshops. And actually it's probably a good thing that I couldn't go back in again. Cause when I went to go in again on Thursday, what, what is this bit of hair doing? Anyway, th Thursday afternoon, it was five o'clock and I didn't realize it was five o'clock and the bookshop was closed. And I was like, oh, okay. Maybe that's a good thing because it stops me from buying any more books considering I already bought loads of books. <laughs> We've got Maryland, Connecticut, South Africa, Phoenix, Denmark, Chicago, Colorado. Wow, so many people. Okay. So thank you so much for spending your evening, morning, afternoon, middle of the night. This guy's like determined to park really aggressively outside. <laughs> but um, yeah, tonight is the live stream. I try my best to answer as many questions as I can, but please understand that I am just one person and I'm not always able to answer everyone's questions. So if I can't answer your question, I've already answered it in a video or I've already answered it in the live stream. I'm not gonna repeatedly answer the same questions because that's gonna get really boring for anyone who's been here for basically the entire live stream. I'm trying a new thing where I'm bouncing around the chat. So please understand that I might be collecting questions together so that they make sense, but I will try to get to everyone if I can. So please don't spam comments or questions because it just means that I get take even longer getting to the questions that have been asked once. Okay, I hope that made sense. Honestly, today has just been like a, I'm just saying a bunch of words and hoping some of them stick. <laughs> so I know that I did get a few at the top, so I will go up to the top to answer those ones. So if you have any particular questions all about witchcraft, paganism and anything in between, feel free to let me know. Okay, I am going to go up to where I was at the very start because I know that a few people did ask. So the first question that I got in was the first comment, I think, on this live stream. So that is dedication. And that is, what's the best way to bond with a haunted doll? So haunted dolls are really fascinating. They are, for anyone who doesn't know, a doll that has been haunted by a spirit. Now that could be a human spirit, that could be a non-human spirit. Some people will create haunted dolls by allowing spirits that would like a vessel to use a doll as a vessel. Other haunted dolls are created simply by a spirit attaching onto the form of a person. So sometimes you will find spirits, especially if they're lost or confused, spirits that are often children when they passed over, are very attracted to the human form and something that they feel resonates with them. And so they might attach themselves onto an object like a doll, which has a physical form. Now it's important to remember that it's not only humans, human spirits that attach onto dolls, but also other kind of spirits as well. So just be careful with that and just bear that in mind. When it comes to connecting with a haunted doll, 
or really any haunted item, the thing is that you want to spend time with them. Because ultimately, even if it is a non-human spirit, that doesn't mean that they are wanting to cause you harm or wanting anything malicious. Sometimes they just want affection or attention or they just want someone to acknowledge them, especially if it is a human. So if you would like to connect with a haunted object, spending time around it is a really good way of doing that. Other good ways are to write down your dreams and your meditations and even your divination work because you might find that the more time you spend with that doll or that item, you might find that they start communicating with you via dreams and that way you can have a deeper connection with the spirit of the doll or other item. As with everything though, just be aware that what's in or attached to that doll isn't necessarily going to be nice and it isn't necessarily going to be telling you the truth either. So I'm not saying that to scare anyone off, just be cautious. And that's the main thing. It's all about being cautious. Right, where was the next one? The next one was about how to banish entities and what's a good book for banishing and protecting. So when it comes to banishing entities, there is no one set way of doing it because it's really gonna depend on what it is that you're trying to banish. Is it energy? Is it a spirit? Is it a targeted spirit? So for instance, is this a spirit that is specifically aiming at you? Or is it just a spirit that's residing within your space that you can't get rid of? Is it a human spirit, non-human spirit? Could it be a familiar or a servitor belonging to either yourself or to someone else? There's so many different things that you might want to banish. So there isn't one banishing spell, but because I read this question before I came on, I did get a book out that I thought could be useful to anyone who is interested in this form of magic. Now, this book is about ceremonial magic. Now, not everyone is gonna practice ceremonial magic, but if you are interested in it, this could be a good one. This is Protection and Reversal Magic by Jason Miller. And actually when you go into the little glossary thing in the back, I forget what these things are called, index. That's what it's called, it's called an index. And you click, you click, you don't click, you look at the banishing section, Banishing Rituals, page 46 to 53. Let's have a look, 46. So you have an entire section, Ooh, if I can flick, of a good few pages on different banishing rituals. So a lot of them are ritualistic in nature, so that's not gonna be for everyone, but it could be good if it's something that you are wanting to just get started in. I think all of them in this book are, as far as I remember, are ritualistic in nature, but it could be a good place to start. And then I think anyway, there usually is a list of, ah, here we go, sources for further reading in the back. And the sources for this one includes Paul Husson, Mastering Witchcraft, which I've spoken about before. Um, anything else? The Roebuck in the Thicket. That's a really hard one to get hold of though. Uh, ba -ba 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 -da -ba -ba. So there's quite a lot in here. I'm just seeing if I can find a book that's specifically on reversal magic. There is some on chaos magic as well though. So if you have this book and you haven't already looked through the references, could be a good thing to do because you might find lots of good reads that kind of come from that. Oh, what did I click on? I clicked on something. Oh no. <laughs> okay, I think I was here. This is my problem is I click on stuff and then I cannot get back to where I was before. Okay. I think I can scroll down now. Oh, here we go. What is your favorite herb for tea slash tea flavor? I actually really don't like tea. I've tried liking tea for so many years. I've tried many different varieties and I just, I just don't really like tea. The only one that I can vaguely stomach is chamomile. And that one is a, it has to be a good day. But chamomile I can do. Um, other teas I've not quite mastered yet. I need to try getting into tea and seeing if I like it. I'm just not like a tea or coffee kind of a person. I'm a, it's either water or it's hot chocolate. There is like nothing in between for me. And so I don't really drink tea. Here we go. Good evening. What is your, what, what is a good book about paganism? I'm an atheist, but kind of interested in learning more about it. So this one's a really interesting question, mostly because I can't answer it. And that's because paganism 
isn't one thing, it's a collective term. So it's essentially an umbrella of hundreds of different religions and spiritual beliefs that fall outside of most of the main religions. And so you can ask 13 different pagans what they follow and they're going to give you 13 different answers because paganism can be so much. It can be from Wicca to more historic practices. Even some witches would consider themselves pagan. You don't even have to have a religion and you can consider yourself pagan if you follow deities or other spiritual beings or entities or even just belief systems that fall outside of the main religious beliefs. And so there isn't one book on paganism as a whole that I can recommend. You might want to look into the different things that fall under paganism to see if any of that piques your interest or if you want to learn a little bit more about the specific things. But I don't know of any really good books that cover lots of different pagan religions, mostly because there's just so many of them that most books just can't cover them all. I'm trying really hard to not immediately break into the random bursts of music that I usually break into. <laughs> I'm trying to like rein it in a little bit. What herbs do you like to use for working with the earth? So when it comes to working with the earth, I don't really use that many herbs, mostly because I find that being outside in nature is the most suitable thing for me to do. Though obviously I understand that not everyone is gonna have the opportunity to be able to do that. There's one plant, well no, there's, there's kind of mm, one main plant that <laughs> I just faffed around with that. One main plant that I will use for connecting with the earth and that is patchouli. And I use it for one main reason and that is because it smells like dirt. If anyone has smelled patchouli, you'll know exactly what I mean. It has this very strong, earthy, fragrance that literally smells like you dug your hand into wet dirt and then you smelt the dirt. That's what patchouli smells like. It's not for everyone. I love patchouli perfume personally because I think it smells amazing, but it is good for working with the earth or at least connecting you psychologically to the earth because it's that kind of link of, oh, it smells like dirt. Therefore, it's connecting me deeper to the earth. Other than that, I do also use things like nettle and grass. Now, nettle is often considered a fire element plant, but as far as I'm concerned, any plant that grows in the dirt in the earth is considered an earth element association because it's literally growing in the dirt. But if you do have a chance to get hold of some patchouli, I'd recommend that you do it, though I do know that at the moment patchouli is really hard to come by in a lot of places in England anyway. I am basically out of patchouli and it kind of hurts my soul. So <laughs> I'm just gonna have to wait till more patchouli comes back in again. But yeah, it's nice if you can get hold of it. Go. What prosperity spell has been the most effective for you? So for me, it's not necessarily that any one prosperity spell Mostly because every spell that I do for anything that I do is almost always different. So there's one working that was the fastest that I ever had, but then I've done a similar working since and the outcomes vary depending on the active situation at the time. So for me, the most effective spell that I have ever done for prosperity is super simple, a candle, some oil, and you light it. And that's always been my most effective spell for almost everything. Um, because I really work well with the fire element and with candles. That's why a lot of the workings that I do, do involve candles. Not everyone is going to have the same experience with candles, but I would say start, if you're interested in prosperity magic of, or really any magic of any kind, start with your energy work and start simple. So you can make rituals more and more complex as time goes on if you find that the simple ones aren't working for you. But if you start small, then you'll know how to expand from it. So a really simple thing is to center your energy, to focus on your intention and your goal. You hold a candle. This could be like a, a birthday candle, a spell candle, a big ritual candle. You're gonna wanna hold it and channel all of your energy into that candle, focusing on the outcome that you want to achieve. And then you take some basic oil. I often use botanical oils that are blended, but you can use just a bit of grapeseed oil or even no oil at all if you wanted. 
and then think of your intention as you light that candle and allow that candle to burn down. Super simple magic is sometimes the most effective. And I often find that if you overdo a lot of rituals without trying the simple ones first, sometimes you can kind of self-sabotage. So those are the ones that I've had the most success with. They're just like the really simple workings. I've already got the Winnie the Pooh theme song in my head. (laughs) And I am (laughs) just trying desperately to just like keep it inside. Okay. Is necromancy a form of divination that's specifically under the umbrella of dark arts? Is it okay to practice it even if I practice forms of magic, practice lighter forms of magic? I wouldn't consider necromancy to be a dark art at all honestly. And this is where it's it's difficult to define good and bad, light and dark, because there is this gray area where depending on your personal stance on these situations, it's going to fall into different categories. Ultimately, it is like a sliding scale and everyone is going to have that dividing mark in a different place. So necromancy is communication with spirits of the dead. And that can be spirits that you know, that can be ancestor work. Communicating with ancestors is a form of necromancy because you are communicating with the spirits of the dead. Necromancy. Except when you call it ancestor work, suddenly everyone's like, oh, oh, that's so nice, good luck. But when you say, I practice necromancy, everyone goes, oh my God, why would you do that? I'm gonna clutch my pearls. And like the reality is, is that It's pretty much the same thing, just in a different context. So I don't think that necromancy would be considered a dark art really anyway, because most of the time, unless you are doing it with malicious intent, there is nothing negative about it. It's a little bit like energy. Energy is neither good nor bad. It's how you use it that makes the difference. It's a bit like that, where you can use necromancy to communicate with people for good and to communicate with people for bad. And so it really isn't a hard and fast thing. So I'd say if you're interested in necromancy, try it, look into it, see if you enjoy that style of practice because there are many many people who only follow positive associations but do undertake ancestor communication which is in essence necromancy and I don't think anything should have like a this is good this is bad this is light this is dark kind of slapped on it because I think there's a lot more nuance to that than a lot of people realize at first glance I hope that makes sense anyway (laughs) I really hope that it does. Ooh, is there a particular direction that you go in when dressing your candles? For example, when bringing something in, releasing, and for protection spells. So, I do it in a little bit of an unusual way, I suppose. Most of the other practitioners of candle magic that I know do it slightly differently. For me, I see that candle as either drawing things in for positive, like things I want to attract in are drawn in from the top down. Things I want to get rid of are pushed out from the bottom up. I see that candle a little bit as you would see a wand. So when you're doing spell work and ritual and you're using your finger or your wand as a way of directing that energy, if you want to draw something into you, you draw it from the end of your wand or your finger down to the base and then into yourself. It's an extension of yourself. If you want to push something out, you're pushing it out from yourself down the length of that wand or your hand or your finger or your athame, whatever it is that you're using, and you are pushing it out. For me, I perceive a candle as being the same. It's an extension of yourself and the same applies. So if I want to attract something in, I will anoint a candle from the top where the wick is down to the bottom and that action draws things down towards me. If I want to get rid of something, I will anoint that candle from the bottom up to the wick, that way I'm directing it out of me. When it comes to protection, I will typically draw down because I see it as something positive that I am bringing in. Like, although it is protecting, it is protecting what I have, so it draws in to kind of protect in around me. For other people, protection 
would mean that they started in the middle of that candle and went to either end. So they'll anoint from the center out both ways. And I do know people whose associations are completely different and they might be complete opposites of that. So it's a case of give them a go, see what works and then really go from there because it's gonna very much vary. I've tried different things and that is the thing that I like the most to do, but everyone's gonna be different. I'm going to Glastonbury in January. Is there anything you deem as a must do or see? I know I've answered this several times in the past, but considering I just got back from Glastonbury, I'm happy to share it again. The tour, if it's not too wet and muddy, I'll be honest, the last few times that I've been, I haven't gone up the tour because it's been raining the entire time. And if you can try going to the Avalon Orchard, it's really, really beautiful. The chalice well is really good on a fine weather day. It's this beautiful gardens where you can get the water, but not so maybe on a really miserable day. But if you can only go into one area, I would go to the White Spring. It's only open three days a week. So just make sure that you check when you're going to see if it's open and it's only open in the afternoons, but it is, oh, it's so beautiful. I'm never gonna be able to show you all what it looks like because they don't allow photography or videos inside, which, I can appreciate it's a sacred space, but it is just beautiful. And then on the high street, you have to go into the bookshops. So Courtyard Books, Labyrinth Books, The Speaking Tree. And then if you can go into Star Child and Sons of Asgard, you will not regret it because damn, I spend a lot of time in those shops. And I actually do have a bunch of items that I got. They're actually, you can't see them. They're literally just down there. Um, so if you would like to, see um, any of the things that I got, feel free to let me know and I will make a whole video on that and torture you all with the amount of books that I got and then I'll add a shit ton of books to your to be read pile. And then you will be simultaneously happy and sad all at the same time. Oh, speak of the devils. Hello, sons of Asgard. How did the frost fair go? Was it all right? <laughs> I saw some pictures earlier and I was like, oh, it looks so busy. I'm kind of glad I wasn't there for the frost fair. That would have been so stressful. Right, I'm trying to figure out where I was again now. Oh, it jumped. Oh no, I'll have to scroll again. <laughs> it does this every time. There was the necromancy question. So I think I was about here, here. Ooh, oh, okay. I don't know if you answered this before, but can you explain how to create a spirit trap? So, Spirit traps are something that I don't necessarily want to be actively promoting how to use them without knowing the ins and outs of individual situations, mostly because I have met, unfortunately, quite a few people who use spirit traps for very cruel purposes because spirit traps, much like anything else, can be used for good and they can be used for not so good. So you can use a spirit trap to contain negative spirits that refuse to leave you alone, like spirits that will not stop. And it doesn't matter how many banishing spells you do, you cannot get rid of them, they're constantly harassing you. In that case, a spirit trap is a really effective and useful tool. However, some people do use spirit traps for the benefit of trapping spirits into objects and items and then selling them for a profit as essentially curios. And uh, that's where it gets a little bit, I don't really like it so much. But generally speaking, it is a box that is a self-contained unit. Now it doesn't have to be a box, but generally the place people start is with boxes and you see these spirits trap boxes all around the world they're called different things and they are essentially a box trap that is sealed and if you open that box you are essentially allowing that spirit to escape and that's where a lot of these like spirit box unboxings on youtube come from they come from the urban legends of these boxes being opened and the spirits being allowed to get out now these boxes can be mirrored so essentially the mirrors are locked, so a spirit can't get out through a mirror and nothing can help by going into the mirror. Instead, they are trapped inside the mirrored space. They are usually contained with a sigil seal or other symbolic figure that is used to represent the spirit that attracts them in. Now, a super, a super, a super simple example of a spirit trap would be something like a witch's bottle that 
has been used to contain a spirit. So if a spirit has been targeting you and it targeted the witch's bottle instead, it becomes trapped in the witch's bottle. Super simple, spirit trap. So that could be a good place to start if you are interested in spirit traps for um, negative spirits that will not leave you alone. Witch's bottles could be a good place to start your research and then expand out. Now on this kind of topic, I don't know if anyone would be interested in this, but there are a lot of subjects that YouTube doesn't really like, especially within the witchcraft communities. It will just like smother a video. So I have been questioning whether on my Patreon, I should post videos that YouTube w won't like. <laughs> so let me know if you would like kind of specific videos for like a small-ish monthly cost on Patreon, just to cover the cost of how much it I spend trying to make these videos. Let me know if you would like that because I have had a lot of questions about things like spirit traps, sex magic, blood magic, um, more negative things that YouTube just doesn't like. So yeah, let me know on that one. But I'm sorry I can't help too much in this context simply because I don't really have enough context to be able to offer you a specific guide for how you can create a spirit trap for your specific circumstances. Can you make a video on shadow work? Um, I could, but, oh, my nose is running now. I could, but I don't think that I am going to, simply because I, it's another one of those where I personally don't always think it's a good idea. And I think a lot of people use shadow work. If, if we're talking shadow work, like I think we're talking, it's essentially therapy without therapy. And it can be incredibly dangerous if people are doing it when they aren't in a safe environment, if they aren't in a good headspace, it brings up deeply embedded trauma for some people. And if they aren't in a space where they're able to cope with that physically, spiritually, mentally, it can make it so much worse. And I've seen it make people so much worse. And you don't have to do shadow work in order to be a good magical practitioner. And I say, if you are dealing with lots of heavy things in your life, if you can, because I know not everyone's able to, do try and do shadow work if you're going to do any with the help of a therapist because the main thing between shadow work because this is a question that just came up shadow work and self-reflection is self-reflection is really just looking in and seeing the things that you might want to improve on seeing the things that maybe aren't working in your life that you can change shadow work drags up all of the repressed emotion and trauma and fear that a lot of people have depending on their life circumstances and can force people to relive it in order to process it but that processing isn't always going to be safe or comfortable and it, it has the potential to put people in really bad situations if they aren't in a space where they're able to deal with that. So if you are wanting to do shadow work, I would thoroughly recommend that you do it with the help of a professional who's able to create that space for you where you can do it in a safe environment. So I'm not gonna be doing a video on shadow work simply because I don't feel comfortable giving people potentially something that is going to cause them more harm if they don't do it in a safe space. But I know that lots of other people do talk about shadow work and maybe their opinions on it are considerably different. Right, where, where was I? Any tips on starting spirit flight? If you can... <clears throat> so the first thing that I'd say if you're starting spirit flight is try to figure out if you already experience it. Because a lot of people have already experienced it in the past and they don't realize it. Some people are experiencing it to this day and they don't realize it. So I have a video on the differences between lucid dreaming and spirit flight and astral projection so that you can kind of figure out whether you already experience it. And then it's a case of getting into your meditations, into your mind calmings, try to create a safe space where you're able to relax fully, as well as writing down any dreams or experiences that you might be having, because often what will happen is that you don't realize that you're doing it because you aren't remembering that you're doing it, because 
you aren't training yourself to retain that information. So starting a dream journal, practicing your meditation can be really good because you don't have to be asleep to do astral projection or spirit flight. It's something that you can do while you're awake. It just takes a little bit more time and effort in order to train yourself to do it. So doing meditations and mind calming is a great way of centering yourself into your time and place. So then you can release yourself into the astral plane and then just checking whether you already do. And once you can acknowledge that you're doing it, you're then more likely to be able to do it going forwards. There was a book and I've forgotten what it's, I don't know where I put it. I cleaned the room so I could film this video. I moved all of the books and now I can't find the book I was after. It's in my most recent quarterly book breakdown. I do have a book in there that is about astral projection that could be good for anyone wanting to learn a little bit more about it. Now I did get, a, a response here. It was great and nice and busy. Hope you're well. I'm very well. And I did get your email, Sons of Asgard, and I will respond to you, I promise. <laughs> but it's just been a busy day. But I'm glad that uh, the Frost Fair was good. I I really enjoyed it when I when I did it. I, I had a stall and um, it rained all day. <laughs> so I'm just hoping that the weather was a little bit better than it was the last time I did the Frost Fair because it was absolutely torrential, basically all day. How do you feel about chaos magic and are you going to do a video on it? I don't really have any strong opinions on chaos magic. I think it's really fascinating. And if anything, I would love to learn a little bit more about it. Um, but I just, I just don't have strong opinions on it. And the fact that I don't actively practice it means I'm not going to do a video on it because my main priority in all of the videos that I do is that I'm able to share my own first-hand experiences. So if I'm not actively doing that form of practice myself or I've never done it, then I'm probably not going to do a video on it simply because I'm not going to be able to add in my experiences on it. I'm trying to figure out where I was again. Ooh, okay, this this one's really interesting. So my question is about the Fae. I had an encounter last night. No, I had an encounter at night. I'm squishing words in here where they don't belong. Watching through the mirror in my bedroom where I saw two small and furry figures with completely black eyes beside my bed. What type are they? So how, I suppose my question is how small are we talking? Are we talking like, like this big? Like little fur ball things? Or are we talking like, bigger. Any kind of scale is really useful. First thing though is they might not be fey. And that doesn't mean that they are scary or anything, but it just means that they might not be fair folk. They could be many, many different kinds of spirits that fall outside of fairies. Now the classifications vary dramatically and the kind of spirits that you're going to have in your area are going to depend entirely on where you are. So I would say if anyone has any kind of spirit encounters, it could be worth looking into the folklore and mythology of the place where you live, especially the land. That's incredibly useful, especially if you do live in North America. It's good to look into the land and the spirits and the history of that place, because you may well find that there are different spirits or sometimes the same spirit with different names than there are in other places in the world. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be a massive help on that one, mostly because it varies so much based on your own location and also the culture and the tradition that are surrounding you. Now I'm sure I saw a question about astral projection that could be quite good to fit in here. So I'm gonna see if I can find that. Ah, here we go. This one's fitting in with the astral projection question. And that is, have you heard of, with, have you heard of someone with uh, aphantasia? Is that what it's called? Aphantasia being able to astral travel? Yeah. Because as far as I'm aware, okay, correct me if I'm wrong, but aphantasia, I can never say it, is an inability to picture images in your mind. The thing is, is that astral travel isn't picturing images in your mind. You're astrally, spiritually separating from your physical form and traveling the spiritual plane. That is happening outside of your physical form. It is your spiritual body that is leaving. It's different to visualization. It's different to lucid dreaming. 
it isn't a dream. It's not happening in your head. It's something that you are experiencing as a spirit in a spiritual plane. So there are many people who can't actively visualize, as in they can't visually see images in their mind who are able to astral project because it uses two different things. They're like not the same category. It's just that people who haven't experienced astral projection do often confuse the two because it's quite, it's quite easy to confuse the two if you haven't experienced it for yourself. So you are perfectly capable of astral projection even if you aren't able to visually visualize. Because there's lots of people who visualize with sounds and with smells and those kind of things. But yeah, <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Please don't feel discouraged because you can definitely still do it. Oh, okay. I broke the stand off a carved stone while I had it in a bag of herbs and chanting it for protection. Do I have to start over and glue it? I think you've already answered your own question there. Mostly because you felt the need to ask, therefore deep down you don't feel comfortable with continuing that working with it being broken. So for me, I probably would have changed it out simply because when something breaks in that situation, it could be a sign that it is either not suitable for that situation or it has done its job. I would say you don't necessarily need to start over, but if you switch out that stone for something else, that could make you feel more comfortable, which is more likely going to manifest in that working. The thing that it really all comes down to is how you feel about it. And if you feel as though you need to change it, change it. If you feel like you need to start over, start over. Because if you're always gonna have that nagging feeling in the back of your mind, then you're probably not going to have a successful working because you're thinking that it's not going to be successful. So you end up kind of undermining your own working, essentially. So you don't necessarily have to start over completely, but do what you feel most comfortable with in this situation. Is there a recommendation on spell books on how to learn to put together your own spells? I personally don't really like spell books <laughs> personally where should i put it this is the problem i have i moved a shit ton of books and I've, I've i've lost the the book that i would use as reference for this but there are spell books out there that you can you can use but i would say for for creating your own spell i have an entire video on this i recommend checking it out because it's going to give you way more information than i'm going to be able to give in this little bit is think about what your goal is I don't just mean money, protection, good luck, health. I mean specifically, like what specifically is it that you're after? If it's for prosperity, is it that you would like a promotion? Is it that you want to do well in a job interview so that you can get a better job to earn more money? Is it to help create a calm environment in your workspace so that you're able to get more work done so you're able to earn more money? Like try to find the specific thing that you're after in this category and then look up different colors that represent the intention different plants that might represent your intention different stones different energies you know whether it's a crystal a tree an animal that you want to draw on maybe there's a tarot card that you feel connected to find the things generally that suit your intention your desired goal and then figure out what in that you feel most drawn to that you can add into that working. Do you want it to involve a candle? Do you want it to be a bag or a pouch or a doll? Do you want it to be simply energy? Are you gonna be doing it physically or astrally? Like, how are you gonna do this? And then once you have all of your components put together, you can then charge them with your energy, draw everything into that working and then release it out into the world. And now how you do that's gonna obviously depend on your tradition and your background. Do you want to use chanting? Are you gonna use a circle? I know it sounds ridiculously complicated now that I'm saying it all like that, but the best way to put together your own spells is to find the things that you feel drawn to and incorporate them into a working off a simple foundation. So for instance, a pouch 
is made up of your energy, your intention. It's made up of herbs, sometimes tag locks, things that represent you or someone else. It includes stones or other visual aids. You charge it and then you carry it around with you. That, can, that style of working, that pouch, can be adapted for any different intention that you can think of. If you want to charge jewelry, you're gonna to want to be holding that jewelry, focusing on your intention, pushing your energy into it. You can do that with any different intention. For any different purpose, you just adapt it to suit that working. So I'd say, generally speaking, look up different techniques for spells rather than specific spells. Because what a lot of people can fall into is that they will find a spell that they really like and they will follow it word for word, but they don't really understand why they're following it or why they're using the things that they're using. And then when it comes to creating their own spells, they don't really know how to do it. So if you can start with just looking up how to do a candle spell or just looking at a simple candle spell, looking up how to do a pouch, how to do a doll, and then adapt it to suit what you want, that's probably gonna stand you in better stead going forwards than it would be if you were to just follow a book. And that's obviously just my experience and my opinion on it. There are good books out there. Um, Pamela, Pamela Ball, Pamela Ball. I think her name is Pamela Ball. She did a good spell book. Let me, hang on, let me have a look. What's this? Or is it Deborah Blake? Where did I get Pamela Ball from? <laughs> I don't know. It, it, I think it's the author of this book. This is um, Everyday Witch A to Z Spellbook by Deborah Blake. I think this is the author who did a few. And these are, they're fine, I guess. Like, they're, they're all right. But you'll notice, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it, as I flick through it, every spell is the same. It is just the same foundation different candle, different day of the week, different words, but it's still candle, words, day of the week. So you, you really can do it entirely yourself and have phenomenal success with it. I'm, I really went off on one with that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I need to not go off on one quite so much with these. Um, do you have a Goodreads account? And if so, can I befriend you there? I actually don't have a Goodreads account. If anyone would like me to have a Goodreads account, um, let me know and I, I will consider doing that. Um, I, I mentioned earlier about doing the specific unusual videos going onto the Patreon, the things that people don't really like so much. And um, another thing that I was considering going on to Patreon were specific book reviews um, where I am not necessarily <laughs> as nice with the reviews because on YouTube I am um, I, I do water the reviews down a, a little bit if I if I hate a book I don't show it is is basically how I, how I go like the book list is from like good to great they're the ones that i show on youtube they're the ones that i really liked and the ones that i thought were freaking amazing um but the ones that i really don't like i don't put on youtube so if you would like me to do some like more brutal book reviews they will be going on the patreon i think um just because that's an easier place for me to put them where people would probably purposefully go on to to watch them because i know that i can't be quite as honest on um YouTube. That's not to say that I'm not truthful in the book reviews, more just that I pick the books that I talk about really carefully <laughs> for good reason, because uh, yeah, YouTube really doesn't like it when you are not nice to books or anything, actually, even if it's just a review and an opinion, they really don't like it. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. Is ceremonial magic rituals all about making an inner transformation? I mean, not really um not at all really as far as i'm aware like most of the ceremonial ones that i have practiced and that i've seen other people practice are about manifesting change that doesn't necessarily mean it's change and transformation inside that's often change externally but it might be through the aid of spirits whether that is 
demons or ancestors or elements or planetary, like whatever it is, it's usually through the aid of an external factor that is incorporated into that ceremonial ritual. So it's still external change, it's just done in a slightly different way than, say, a folk magic practitioner would perhaps do. I have a distinct memory of something sitting in my bath slash shower when I was really young. I didn't understand much of the paranormal, but would that possibly have been a fae? It could have been, definitely. I mean, it could have, I mean, it could have been any other spirit as well. But the Fae do seem particularly drawn um, to children, in a way, more so than I think other spirits are. I've known a lot more people have Fae interactions as children than, say, demonic interactions as children. So, who knows? It could well have been a fae. I know that I experienced a lot of fae when I was young and lots of other people do as well. So I definitely wouldn't, um, I, I wouldn't say that it wasn't. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I want to see br brutal book reviews. What was the other one here? Yes, pay for the hate. No, the unfortunate thing is that, uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of need to... <laughs> pay for the electricity that I use to make these videos. So um, yeah, they'd have to go on the Patreon, I think, but uh, it's an option. I I'm doing a big overhaul next year of the Patreon with like Book of Shadows pages and these kind of things. So that's the plan for next year. I'll add it to the list of things that I need to, need to focus on. Right, where was I? I was here somewhere. <laughs> Oh god, the songs have started. <laughs> what is your favourite type of divination? I, I feel like I get asked this every month and I can never give a solid answer because it really does change so much. The form of divination that I use the most at the moment is tarot, but that being said, I did just get a brand new deck. I will be talking about this in the Glastonbury video, but I got a deck. It's called the Illuminated Tarot, but it isn't a tarot, which really confused me. And I've used this so much over the last like 18 hours. I started reading with it and I just, I just couldn't stop. And it's really interesting because they're based on playing cards, which is a form of divination I have never really used before. I've never used playing cards, but they're really beautiful. I'll see if I can find a good representation of the cards. So they look like this, if it'll focus on it. And they are just so pretty. So I'm gonna try and get into some divination with playing cards because it's something I've always been interested in, but I just have never done it. So this could be my new favorite form of divination because so far over the last like 18 hours, <laughs> I've used this deck more than like anything in my collection. So, um. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to see. But this one might become my new favorite form of divination. Playing cards, super simple. It's something that everyone probably has access to fairly affordably. If you don't already have a deck of playing cards, I'm sure that you'd be able to find one fairly cheaply. I mean, Christmas is coming. And although not everyone celebrates Christmas, if you have a family that does celebrate Christmas and they have Christmas crackers, you can often find playing cards in Christmas crackers. So bear that in mind as we get into the Christmas season, if you do celebrate Christmas, and um, because you might find yourself a new form of divination in your cracker set, if someone's willing to give up a tiny pack of playing cards. <laughs> Can a novice do a witch's bottle? Yeah, completely. And if anything, witch's bottles and protections like it are probably simpler than wards and shields. Mostly because instead of relying on your own energy, you are working with your energy as well as tag locks and the associations that you're putting into that bottle. If anything, scapegoat spells are easier than a ward or a shield for that reason. You know, you are just creating a 
physical double, well, not well, an energetic double in a physical form that a spirit or energy is attracted to. And that way it traps them inside the bent pins and all of that. So arguably, yeah. I think that a novice can very effectively do a witch's bottle, especially if you have that drive to do it. Now I'm gonna have to get up and turn off my heater because I've gone from freezing to melting. I I have to turn it off before I start boiling. Let's clip this off. Okay. I will inevitably put it back on again before the end of the live stream, but oh, that heater is warm and the lights are very warm <laughs> and it's heated this room up so quickly. Okay, where was I? Do you think it's possible to pacify a problematic spirit? To direct workings at it in order to make it nicer? Ooh, this is kind of a twofer question. It's kind of a doubled up one. So I think that you can definitely aid in pacifying a problematic spirit. Do I think that the way to do that is targeted spells and rituals? Maybe not. <laughs> Mostly because depending on the spirit that you are interacting with, targeting it with spells has the potential to simply make it angrier. Now, banishing spells are one thing that's kind of separate because the banishing spell essentially forces it out of your space. It's not necessarily attaching it onto that spirit. But I'd say if you want to pacify a problematic spirit, communication is really good. Sometimes just saying, hey, I don't know if you realize it, but what you're doing is really annoying or, you know, stop me from sleeping or any of these things. Because sometimes spirits don't realize that what they're doing is problematic for you. They don't realize that them banging in the middle of the night is keeping you awake because they aren't thinking of that. They're just trying to interact and communicate. So it's trying to figure out why that spirit is problematic. Is it problematic because it's trying to get your attention and you're ignoring it? Is it problematic because it doesn't realize that what it's doing is causing you problems? Is it being problematic because it's purposefully trying to annoy you? And depending on which outcome it is, it's gonna change what you do next. So if it's trying to get your attention and giving it a little bit of attention appeases it. So it goes, oh, okay, well, they've noticed me now. I don't have to be banging in the middle of the night or whatever it might be doing. Then it's just a case of greeting it, you know, saying good night every time you go to bed, saying good morning when you wake up in the morning, saying goodbye to it when you leave, saying hello to it when you come back in again. And that can sometimes just pacify that spirit because all it wanted was for you to acknowledge its existence. That was it. If it is a spirit that doesn't realize that what it's doing is not particularly nice, then voicing it, saying it, you know, hey, can you please stop? Like, I will give you a set of hours that you could make this noise in, but please don't do it in the middle of the night. And then you might find that that simply helps as well. You can also write it on a piece of paper and then burn that piece of paper. That's a good way of sending it into the spiritual plane where you might get an answer a little bit quicker. So that's a good option. If it is that the spirit is purposefully trying to not be particularly nice, then I would say protections are really useful. Temporary shields can be good if it is something that is very transient because if they find that what they're doing is not affecting you in any way, they might get bored and just toodle off to bother someone else or simply just not do with that anymore if they know that they're not getting the response that they want. If the response they want from you is fear or if it is upset, then if you are not giving them that response, then they'll go and find something else or someone else to bother. Now, in some circumstances, you might find that doing spells on a spirit could be a good alternative, but that's really only as a last resort. You know, you can be doing binding spells, you can do spirit traps, you can do banishing. Spirit traps I would do as a very, very last resort, but um, it's an option if you are literally running out of things that you can do. And that means like after you've tried doing cleansings, after you've tried giving offerings, after you've tried banishing anything else, then you might want to try 
bindings or traps as a very last resort. Right, let's see if I can figure out where I was. Do, 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 do. I've lost where I was again. It bounced and now it's gone. Oh, okay, this is an interesting one. What are monitoring spirits and how do you stop them? Now, I've never really heard of a monitoring spirit, like as a spirit in its own right. So if there's any additional information that you can give about that, I would appreciate it. Is it a spirit that is watching you, following you? Is it something that has been sent by another practitioner in order to keep tabs on you? Like what is a monitoring spirit for you? Generally though, if you are finding that a spirit is following you and it is maybe keeping tabs on you, maybe it is a servitor or a familiar of another practitioner, there's a few options that you can carry out. You can keep with your protections, that way it can watch but it can't touch and that's a good option. But if you don't want them to know anything really, it's about creating a distraction. So this could be having an invisibility spell on yourself whilst you create a servitor that has your energy that's going and doing other things. Now, by invisibility spell, I don't mean a spell that's gonna make you physically invisible. Instead, energetically, you essentially don't exist in that place. It makes you less noticeable to spirits and people, but if they look directly at, at you, they can still see you. But by doing this kind of invisibility, invisibility working on yourself, whilst creating a servitor that can go out and essentially be you, they are more likely to be going for the larger energy signal. So they're more likely gonna be going and following the energy that you've created in that servitor as it goes wandering around the neighborhood somewhere while you can go about your day-to-day -day life without being followed. And then eventually they usually get bored and they vanish. Yeah, like a cloaking device. So essentially you are there but energy wise, they're not gonna be able to see you quite as easily. And it just gives you that chance of giving them a distraction so that you can go off and do your own thing. Right, I'll go back up to where I was again now. Okay, this one is about the lesser banishing ritual. I have not performed the lesser banishing ritual in probably the better part of 15 years. <laughs> so I have not done it in a very, very long time. So when, when the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram is performed, do you visualize the angel outside the circle or inside? I'm gonna open this one up to any of you who practice this actively. Can we get an answer for this one? Because I have not done this in many, many years, and I do not remember even how it's done. So I will open this up to all of you. This one, however, is quite interesting. This one is, do you have any advice for overcoming a fear of divination and constantly getting negative spreads? So I think a lot of people have a fear of spirits and divination. I suppose the one thing that I will say when it comes to fearing getting negative spreads or readings is that that is not a definitive answer. No divination technique is ever going to be a definitive answer. It is the current trajectory if nothing changes, but basically anything has the potential to change. You brush your teeth five minutes later than you were meant to that could change so many things. And then if you were to do that reading again, you might get a completely different answer simply because you changed that one thing. You picked up the wrong pen for work and that pen ran out and it meant you had to talk to one of your coworkers to let them borrow you a pen. And then all of a sudden, the trajectory of your entire day may have changed and you don't necessarily realize that it's changed because you don't notice anything different because you don't really know what the other alternative was. The thing when it comes to reading is it tells you how it's potentially going to go. And it gives you information that 
you wouldn't know otherwise. So having a negative reading doesn't mean that that outcome is going to manifest. It's just something to take into consideration. And if you don't want to do, say, general day readings, then just do readings that surround a specific aspect of your life. So it doesn't have to be a person. So you could just say, you know, how is my finances going to be? You know, how are my finances going to be for the next week? And you just do that reading. And it doesn't give you any specifics. You know, it's just going to give you vague answers, vague things. Note it down. Don't even think about it. Come back to it in a month's time, look at it and see if what you read had any bearing on what actually happened. And that way you can kind of get a feeling of how it's going to show up in your life because it's not going to be, usually anyway, it's not going to be as definitive as what the cards say. You know, if you get, let's think, like the three of swords and the tower and death, it's not literally going to be that someone gets stabbed three times and then they fall off a building during a lightning strike and then they die. <laughs> it's not going to be that literal. It's going to be way more fluid than that. And the other thing that you can do is don't use cards that have negative associations. If you can, get a deck of probably oracle cards that have primarily positive cards. That way you can start getting into reading and you're only going to be seeing the positive cards, the things that you need to focus on to improve your day. Because that's really the main difference. The positive cards are gonna tell you what you need to do to improve. They're not gonna tell you what happens if you don't. Whereas with cards that have more negative associations or tarot, for instance, you're more likely gonna be told what's gonna happen if you don't improve, not necessarily how to fix it. So there's ways around it if you are nervous about doing divination. I would say start with Oracle perhaps, and then move into tarot if you get more comfortable with it, because that way it's kind of a gentle ease into doing it. And then it's also gonna depend on the type of cards that you're using, what you feel drawn to. You know, don't go for a deck that solely has negative associations if that's something that you're not gonna feel comfortable with. Oh, how do I know my deity is responding to me when I talk to them? So this one can be in many different ways and it's gonna depend on who you are as a person, how you experience things. So it could be that you feel the breath of a breeze, for instance, or you can smell a smell that isn't normally there, something maybe floral or perfumey or earthy, you know, whoever the spirit is or deity that you're interacting with, it's gonna vary. You might find that the energy shifts. You might find that in your divination it comes up, in your dreams it comes up, in your meditations. So just make sure to keep note of all these because you might find that there are things coming up that you aren't paying attention to if you aren't acknowledging it when it's happening. Um, what are, oh, I'm a closeted witch. What are some best advice? What are some of the best advices that you can give in terms of working with deities? you don't need anything, is probably the biggest piece of advice that I can give you is that you don't need anything. So you'll often find videos and, and I have them, you know, I have statues and artwork and images and it's not a requirement. So if you aren't open about sharing your practice, your spiritual beliefs, your religion, any of that, you don't need to. Because working with a deity is about how you perceive the world, how you interact with them, the things that you believe and how you communicate with them is more important than having statues and items and incense and any of the other things that you might have in association with that deity. So first and foremost, for anyone who is practicing witchcraft or is following a spiritual religion in their private space, and they're not allowed to share it openly, you don't need hundreds of items. And you are probably gonna have a better practice for not having hundreds of items to start off with you can practice successfully with only your energy and your intention or your communication and your connection with deities. That is enough for you to start having a successful magical and religious practice. Everything else is simply a bonus. Love spells that works. Uh, I mean, very vague question. 
what kind of spell are we talking? And don't just say love again. I mean, like, what specifically are you after? Because that is a huge, huge category that covers so many different kinds of spells. Though they might all fall under the category of love spell, what what are we looking for here? Is it self-love? Is it amplification of pre-existing love? Is it friendships? Is it um, familial love? Is it connection with people, attracting new people in, making yourself more attractive, making yourself more desirable? Is it targeted at a specific person? Is it more of a domination working? Like what specifically are you looking for? And then once you know more what you're specifically looking for, you're probably gonna have more luck finding it going forwards. Now, there's one here. Yeah, this one. This is another one about spirits like earlier. Um, Since I was a kid, there was a strange shadow figure, but with red orange eyes that follows me everywhere. And it scares me every time I'm alone in any part of my home. Do you know what it is? Simple answer, no. As with the other spirit questions earlier, it's worth looking into the folklore and mythology of your particular area because it may well be that it's a spirit that we don't have in England, but is maybe found elsewhere. Now, one of my main questions to you, and you don't have to answer it in here, just answer it to yourself, is, is it actively scaring you or are you perceiving it as being scary? And that's gonna make a massive difference as to figuring out what it is. Because there are many spirits who might scare you simply because of their presence, because of how they appear, because of the unknown, but that doesn't inherently make them scary or purposefully being malicious towards you. And knowing which one it is is gonna massively help you find out more information about it because then you can look up different stories from your local area and you can tell almost straight away whether it's something that is maliciously trying to cause harm or whether it's something that just is there and people are just interacting with it oh thank you so so much dragon i really really appreciate it thank you oh everyone's so lovely tonight i love doing the live streams because i like getting to actually interact with you interesting okay <laughs> and thank you so much Astro Chimp Ham. That is an impressive name. Thank you so, so much. Where was I? I think I was about... Okay, that was the divination question. Um, okay, I answered that one. It bounced. It's, I didn't say that it bounced, but it bounced. And now I'm like trying to figure out where I was. Um, okay, how long does it take a spell to work? So this is a really interesting one. Um, that is an entirely flexible answer. And I know that that's really annoying, but that's just how it is, unfortunately. It's gonna depend on what it is that you were looking to manifest, how likely that is to manifest. So for instance, if you wanted to say, get a promotion at work, and I, I always go for prosperity because most people like doing prosperity spells. If you wanted to get a promotion at work and you're already in the running for a promotion and you know that they're going to be giving someone a promotion and you're already working hard, then doing that working to gain a promotion is probably only gonna take as long as it takes them to decide who's going to get that promotion. But if you were say unemployed and you wanted to be a millionaire, that's gonna be a lot more difficult for it to manifest, especially if there's no opportunity for that to happen. You could be waiting your entire life and have that working not manifest because it's simply building on what is already in your life. So in some instances, you will have workings that manifest within hours, days, and in others, it could be weeks or months, depending on what it is that you are asking for. Now you can put in essentially a timer into that working. So much like you would with servitors, you essentially put a timer on it. Once that timer runs out, that energy is done and it's not gonna manifest anymore. That can be useful in certain circumstances. So for instance, if you really wanted to push hard to do really well and memorize lots of things before an exam, there's no point in that energy continuing to manifest after you've already graduated 
because that's not going to have a purpose anymore. You're just going to be wasting energy on something that is no longer required. You know, you don't need to work hard for an exam. So you, that energy is just wasted. So you could say, you know, this is to help me focus and memorize for such and such a date. And you would insert that date into that working. That way you're going to have all of the energy of that working squished into a shorter time frame. This is especially useful if you're working with spirits as well, because that way they know when their deadline is. It's much easier to get stuff done quickly if people know when it is that they have to do it by. So that is a good option. Just bear in mind that you might limit your workings a little bit if you're doing that on every working, you know. It's not always going to be the best idea, especially for things like protection workings, things like that. Um, it's generally good to have it a little bit more open-ended, generally speaking, anyway. Everyone on Witch Talk keeps on talking about baneful wards, but never show you how to make them. How do you make them? Are we talking like wards to protect against negative intention. I always find the wording that they use on TikTok is very different to the wording that is used in basically any other location for magical practice. I don't know if anyone else has seen this. They just use words that are completely different to what everyone else uses. I'm guessing that that would mean like protection shields against negative things. So there's, there's many different ways to do this and I, I will have to do a full video on this. Um, so there's a, f I already said that there's a few different ways of doing this. The first one is a really simple, um, yeah, it sounds like they mean offensive wards, like wards that negatively impact other people. But I think what they mean is wards to protect against baneful magic, but they've just shortened it into like two words, which is kind of confusing. But anyway, for, for, protection wards, you can start with personal shields. So I have a video on my channel called the three rings of protection. That's the one that I use personally in really short temporary moments. And that is essentially, you'll have to watch the video for a full explanation of it. It's way more in depth than I'll do here, but you gather your energy up, you push it out into three concentric rings around you that are three walls of energetic protection. If you want to make that more long-term or you want to use it on a bigger object, so whether that's moving around you or whether that is a house or something, you're going to need to draw that energy from something else because otherwise you're going to drain yourself too quickly. So for instance, you might use a like an iron coffin nail, like an iron railway nail that's often used and it's, it's a good way of grounding it into the earth. You might want to be using some kind of symbol that is within your space. It's going to act as that central core. You are going to want to draw energy from a source outside of yourself. So this could be the full moon. That's a really good option. You could try the earth. That's a great option. You could try a particular event. So sunrise, for instance, you are going to be drawing in the energy from that particular event, drawing it into yourself you're going to want to cast it into a bubble sphere around the space that you want to protect. You are going to want to hold onto the object that you're gonna to use to anchor that working, whether that is a, a statue, whether that is a book, a candle, an iron nail, whatever it is that you're using. Iron nails are the one that I would personally recommend that you use, or silver items are really good for this as well. And then you're going to essentially detach that energy from you into the object that you're gonna be using as an anchor. This then is going to be connected to the energy. This is really complicated. It's so complicated and <laughs> it's so difficult to explain. This is gonna then be attached onto the energy that you're using. So for instance, if you drew on the energy of the full moon, you have then linked this object to the energy of the full moon that you have used to create this bubble, this sphere. You're then placing that object either in the ground or on the property. It is then linked to the full moon's energy, but also to the sphere. So every full moon, it's going to be drawing that energy into itself again, because like attracts like, and it will continue that shield of protection. 
So if you're doing this at like sunrise, every sunrise, that object is gonna go, oh, this is something I recognize. I'm gonna link to it again. It links to the sunrise into the object and maintains that shield. And that way you can keep up a protective shield for decades, as long as what you are linking it to is a constant source of energy. I desperately hope that made sense. This is why it's so, so difficult to do any kind of energy-based video because it's so hard to explain <laughs> unless you have experienced it yourself. So I hope that makes sense. I'm not even sure if that is an answer to your question, but I, I hope that, that it helps somewhat. Are fidelity spells considered black magic? Once again, as with everything, sliding scale, nothing is either, or nothing is entirely good or bad. How you use that is going to vary how people perceive it. And so there is no way for anyone to really determine whether something is purely good or purely bad. Everyone is just gonna be slightly different. Oh, thank you so, so much. JP Lily, I, I'm hoping that's how you say your name. Thank you so, so much. I really, really appreciate it. Can I use deities from two different pantheons? Um, I mean, I guess you can. It's entirely gonna depend on whether they feel comfortable working with you at the same time. Some deities are very much like, mm -mm, nope, either I have you by myself or I'm not working with you. Whereas other deities are very flexible to that. So it's really gonna depend on your relationship with them. Ask them is probably the simplest of answers. Ask if they are willing to work with you alongside another deity. Mention the deity that you are wanting to work with them alongside and then see what reaction that you get because it's, it's gonna vary deity to deity. In reference to your last video in Taglocks util utilizing paper, how would you properly dispose of the ashes? I, I think I mentioned it in a previous video, but not that one. So depending on what it is that you're using it for, you're going to want to re remove them in, in different ways. So if it's something that you want to banish as it was in that video, you wanna get rid of it, I would rinse it with water and then I would tip it down the toilet, flush it. <laughs> especially if it's something like paper. It's so much easier to do it that way. You can rinse it with water and tip it outside because ultimately all it is is paper ashes. It will just go into the soil. If it's something that you want to attract in, so it's something that you've done say on a full moon instead of a new moon, you can take those ashes, put them in a plant pot in your home and that way it's gonna continue bringing that energy into the space. So the, the way you deal with it is gonna depend on what you want. If it's something that you want out of your life, my favorite way by far is always tipping the little bits of ashes into the toilet, flushing it. It's great. You can even do it for things that you haven't burned. If you really want to get rid of something, write it on some toilet paper. You can fill in the blanks. I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. <laughs> it's super simple, but it's super effective. Right, where was I? I was, I was, oh, it jumped again. I think I was, wait, where was I? I think I was about here. Yeah, I have to have been about here. I must have been, yes. Yes, I was, I was here. Do. do love spells actually force someone to love you or do they just nudge someone in that direction when they already feel a certain way? Like, do they just remove someone's inhibitions or actually force it? That is very dependent on what particular working someone has carried out. And that's why I don't agree with the hatred of love spells because it's just such a huge topic. Love spells can do everything from make someone more appealing to essentially attract in people organically. So you make yourself more appealing, therefore people are more appealed by you and they're more likely to strike up a conversation with you. Everything that goes from there is completely organic and that's what a lot of people will choose to do. Sometimes it might be amplifying love that already exists in a relationship by allowing you to have more time to spend with your partner or allowing the communication to flow better between two people. Some spells are designed to attract in potential romantic partners. So it essentially sends a message out there of, hey, I'm available. If anyone wants to come and talk with me, I'm here. 
And then anything that happens once that conversation has started is completely organic. Or you have dominating spells which purposefully target a person with the intention of altering their opinion of you to essentially draw them into you. Now, not all love spells are going to be the same. And so it's really going to depend on the intention of the person who's casting the spell, how they go about it, essentially. Like, what happens is going to entirely depend on what they were after. But I do think it's important to remember here that it's not going to create something out of nowhere. This is why love spells on celebrities simply don't work. As I mentioned earlier, spells, rituals, they need something to attach onto. They need just, just a little bit of kindling to allow them to start up. So if someone casts a love spell that's designed to make someone love you on a celebrity that's never met you before, they're never going to meet you, they have no idea who you are, they have no idea that you even exist, there is nothing for that spell to attach onto. And that's why you don't see people casting love spells on celebrities and having it manifest and have this celebrity just in this random neighborhood with this random person and they don't know each other and they don't know how they got there. Because there isn't that kindling to start with. There needs to be something that it can build on. So even if someone does a dominating spell, if that person doesn't even know that you exist, there isn't anything for it to attach onto so that it can continue burning. It's, it's essentially, I suppose, the best way to look at spells and rituals is it's that spark. So you are sparking the energy by casting a lot of it out in one go. But if that spark doesn't have anything to land on that's flammable, it's just going to go out. That's pretty much what spell work and ritual is like. That's why it's pretty important to plan your spells accordingly. You know, spells done rashly without any thought often don't manifest because there isn't really anything for it to build on whereas you need to really plan how you're going to be targeting your spells which ways you're going to do it so you can best get that kindling so that that spark can do something what do you think about pre-made ritual candles do you recommend them do you recommend using them for spell work? I actually make pre-made ritual candles and I think they can be really useful. But, and I say this with people who buy from me as well as people who buy from anyone else, make sure you are using your own energy as well. So pre-made ritual candles could be anything from a candle in a particular color that is used for a ritual. That's technically a ritual candle. There's no energy in it. It's just the color or maybe the scent or the shape that you are aiming towards. You can also get pre-made ritual candles that are charged with spells and they have oils and herbs and everything else in them. Regardless of which one you're using, make sure you use your own energy because you can burn a candle that looks like a heart, for instance. You can burn that by itself. But if you aren't putting any energy in it, if there's no intention behind it, if there's no focus behind it, it's not going to do anything. You can burn a pre-spelled candle, but you need to link that candle onto your life. So you're going to want to be thinking of your desired outcome as you are using it. You're going to want to be focusing on the way that that would make you feel, how the outcome would feel if it had already happened. You might want to have items that represent your desired outcome either under the candle or around the candle. You might also want to additionally charge that candle with your own energy as a way of attaching it onto you. You might want to include tag locks such as photos, business cards, nail clippings, hair, those kind of things if it's something that you think is going to help. I would never say just use a candle straight as it is. I'd say uh, add something into it, even if it's pre-spelled, just because it's going to give you way more manifestation power, because it's got you in that candle as well then. It's not just another practitioner, it is specifically you. And also it stops it from having energies from other people on it. If it's been handled a lot before it's been sent to you or before it's ended up in a store, it may well have been picked up quite a few times. So charge it with your energy. It's probably the best advice that I can give when it comes to pre-spelled candles. And also just candles in general, if you're going to use them for spell work and ritual. 
Oh, hi health. Can you can you explain remote viewing? Have you ever done it? So this is an interesting one because how people explain remote viewing is going to be different for everyone. For me, the best way to explain remote viewing is that it's astral projection without traveling to the astral plane. So you are outside of yourself. So you are spiritually separated from your physical body, but you have not traveled to the astral plane. You are in this in-between space where you're in the physical world, but in a spiritual form. So you can perceive things outside of yourself. And also you can see yourself, which is kind of weird. And it's this kind of strange in-between. Um, and honestly, that's probably the only way I can describe it because it's kind of weird to try and describe, but I, I hope that that makes sense. How is your book writing going? It is going slowly because I am a perfectionist who hates everything that they write after they write it. Um, I'm the same with everything now, I'm the same with my videos. Every video I've ever made, I hate it. I, I don't know what it is. As soon as I create it and it's out there, I hate it. So I really don't want to hate the book. So I'm like determined to make it as good as I can, but like <laughs> I need to learn to not be quite as much of a perfectionist. <laughs> Ooh. Would you recommend connecting with slash inviting in house spirits slash energies like brownies or creating servitors to help keep the house cleaned, keep energies in balance? I mean, that in itself is a fine balance. I'd say of the two, a servitor is most likely to help. Um, mostly because house spirits, especially fae, house fae like brownies, can swing either way. If you keep the house clean, if the house is tidy, if you give offerings regularly, they will be as sweet as pie. They will be lovely. Little sweethearts, I love brownies. But if they don't like something that you're doing or they don't like the smell of something or you forgot an offering or you dusted something into their space, all of a sudden they're not going to offer you help. So as long as you can maintain that connection with them, then you'll golden, <laughs> you are good to go. But if you aren't able to consistently maintain that connection with them, go for a servitor. Because a servitor will then have been created specifically for the purpose of helping to clean up unwanted energies, helping to keep the house cleansed and fresh and lovely. And that is their job. And as long as you maintain their energy, to be fair though, their energy could be their reward for cleaning up the energy. So you could create the servitor and say that your energy is the energy that you clean up. That's how you are going to be powered. That way, kill two birds with one stone. You have created a man-made spirit who is helping you clean up your energetic space and they are self-sustaining because they are feeding off the energy that they are cleaning up. It is a fantastic idea if servitors are something that you are interested in doing. And it does mean that you will have to cleanse way less <laughs> because they're essentially doing that job for you. I don't know. I've got that song in my head again. I don't know where it comes from. Um, Oh, how can one create an astral altar or an inner altar? So there is actually, I'm gonna see if I can find the book. I might not be able to find it, so we will see. Um, it's here somewhere. Um, Precast as well, this, this is the book that I was after. Oh, oh. It is called, this is a very, this is a very battered copy of this book. You, this has been through hell. Can you see this? All of the plastic on the front of it has all come off. Um, there is a section in here for that exact thing. Oh, I didn't tell you the book. This is Witchcraft Theory and Practice. And in here are a bunch of post-it notes that I did about <laughs> 10 years ago. And in here, there's an entire section on it. So essentially they are different. So 
Creating an inner altar is essentially a visualization technique that allows you to create an internal sacred space that allows you to carry out workings mentally and energetically rather than physically and energetically. It's a way of doing your workings without having any objects or requiring anything in the physical world. It's a really good idea if you are just getting started. I'm trying really hard to find this section in the book at the same time. And um, that's a really good option. An astral temple or an astral space is a section that you create for yourself in the astral plane. It is somewhere outside of yourself, outside of this realm of existence, and you travel there during astral flight or spirit flight in order to carry out spell work and rituals. Some covens will have them as a way of undertaking their workings collectively, even if they live thousands of miles apart. So there are covens that are spread out all across the world, and they will get together every month in one place, and it's usually a designated coven astral temple where they can all visit astrally so they can do their workings as a coven together you don't have to do this in a group you can what was that beeping noise <laughs> i think someone's fire alarm just went off um but it allows you to do your workings in the astral now one thing you do have to be careful with with an astral temple you are creating it in the astral plane, which doesn't just belong to you. And that's the big difference between the two. An inner temple or an inner sacred space is something that solely belongs to you. It is inside you. And so nothing else is going to be able to interact with it because it's inside. An astral temple or an astral sacred space is different because an altar. I know this is all about altars, but it kind of all fits into the same thing. The astral plane doesn't just belong to the practitioner. It belongs to thousands of different spirits, thousands of different practitioners. Anything that you can imagine will probably be on the astral plane. I've seen some weird shit. <laughs> and uh, so you have to make sure that you're doing it safely. So make sure that the way you're taking is convoluted. Make sure that it's in a relatively safe space. Make sure you have protections and locking mechanisms. Make sure that the way you leave is a different way and it's convoluted as well. Ideally try to come and go in different ways every single time you come and go. And um, that's something that you will build up over time practicing astral projection. So the biggest difference between the two, an inner altar and an inner sacred space is way, way simpler. So you would start by entering into meditation or mind calming to be able to still your mind. And then you are gonna be visualizing your sacred space. Now you don't have to visually visualize. I think a lot of people are confused as to what visualization is. Visualization isn't that you close your eyes and you can see things with your physical eyes. When I close my eyes and I visualize, there is nothing going on here. <laughs> I can't see anything with my eyes because it's not happening with my eyes. My eyes are not a part of it. So I feel like the term visualization confuses people because there's nothing going on here. It's everything going on up here. It's a bit like reading a book. You read the words, the story plays out in your mind. That's what visualization is. So you are creating a mental place that you can go to in order to do your spell work and ritual. That could be in a fairy tale castle. That could be in a cave in the middle of the woods. That could be deep at the bottom of the ocean. Wherever your mind wants to take you, you can create your own inner temple, inner sacred space, where you can travel to in order to do spell work and ritual in your own space. It's um, interesting. It's really interesting. <laughs> I love doing, I love doing inner work. It's also way easier because <laughs> you don't need to have objects or items or anything like that. You, you can just be super, super, super simple. Okay, um, I plan to be in contact with people I've drifted away from. Is it possible to send an invitation out to someone in the energetic plane, but not force them to reunite with me unless they want to? Yeah, so there's a few ways that you can do this. In dreams, you can contact them if you are able to lucid dream. You can send out servitors or familiars in order to reach out to this person. Nothing is ever forced. It's all about just sparking that intrigue. Or... Probably the simplest way is to write their name on a piece of paper and then talk to them. You can write an entire piece of paper if you want, or you can just think about it. Talk to this piece of paper with their name written on it. You can even have a photograph if you like. And 
you, you can put like, call me, text me, message me, whatever it is onto this piece of paper. And you wanna focus really, really, really hard on it. And ideally you wanna be doing this during the waxing moon phase, if you're gonna be burning it. And then you fold it up in a little ball. You think about them really hard and then you set it on fire, drop it into a cauldron and it releases that energy out there. And the whole point of this is to be like, oh, damn, I've not spoken to such and such a person in ages. I should probably get in touch with them. Or they might go, wow, I just randomly thought of this person and I have no interest in getting in touch with them again. And like either outcome is possible, but it just starts that energetic link of being like, oh, I should maybe con consider getting in touch with them again, perhaps. And it, it never forces, it just kind of puts that idea in their mind. So that is an option. You can also go kind of complicated I say kind of complicated, but you can use something like, ah, oh, look at this, I just have a skull candle on hand. This is, my house is full of random stuff. Um, you can use things like skull candles. A lot of these are on sale because of Halloween. I also make these in beeswax. That's why I have one just sitting on my desk. So I use skulls for communication and connecting with someone's mind and their thinking and their thought process. So you can create or have a skull any color works, but pink is good for friendship, red is used for romantic relationships, blue is used for communication, those kind of things. And you are gonna to want to write their name on the skull. So this skull represents this person. And then you're gonna to wanna to put it somewhere where you can see it and interact with it. And you are going to want to talk to it. Talk to them and talk to them and talk to them as though they're sitting right in front of you. And then once that energy has been built up, you can then burn the candle, it releases it all out. And then that person is going to be interacting or wanting to interact with you um, if that's something that they want, of course. And you've already started that link because you've spent time talking to them. You've, you're showing them that you are willing to build this connection, this relationship with them again, if they are willing to reach out to you. So that is a good option as well if you do like working with candles and skulls and all of those kind of things. I'm trying to figure out where I was again. Oh, I've lost where I, oh, it's gonna jump. Oh no, I can feel it. I can feel it. Have you ever read the book called Nocturnal Witchcraft? If so, what did you think of it? I have never read it, but I will copy that name so that I can see it in the future. And then I will see, oh, I recognize that book cover. Okay, I recognize the book cover, I've never read it. So I'm gonna have to give that a go and see how I think, of, see how I feel about it, see what I think about it. I tried to merge two different sentences. Oh, it did jump. Oh, I didn't even notice that it jumped. I thought it was just about to jump, but no, it had, it had already jumped. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna see if I can find where I was again. That's about the book. Um, where was I? What's a good cleanse technique? I have two separate videos on cleansing. One is about smoke cleansing and one is about smoke free cleansing that hopefully will be able to help. Fingers crossed, anyway. Oh, okay, I think I was about here. I think, okay, that was about the Supernatural tarot deck, which by the way is really cool. I just started watching Supernatural. I have never seen it fully before. I'm on season two and I am just thinking, damn, why did I never watch this before? <laughs> it's been on the TV for like 15 years. And I I started watching it when it first came out, I think. And I just never continued watching it. And now I'm like, damn, it's pretty good. I, I will admit it's pretty good. Oh, now that I'm seeing your cards, I'd like to know if you do any type of ritual or cleansing before using any deck or do you use it right away? So I, it depends on the deck. There are some decks where I will get them and I will do kind of a tester. So I'll, I'll feel them, I'll feel their energy, I'll see how it feels. If I like it, I'll keep it. If I don't like it, I'll cleanse it. And if I like the energy, I will do 
a reading and I will see how that reading comes out and if I don't feel like it's really connecting to me I will cleanse it if if I like it, then I'll keep it. So like this deck, I only got this yesterday. Yes, yeah, yes, yesterday morning, I think. And I opened it up and I was like, mm, I'm not sure how I feel about it. And then I started reading it and I was like, damn, accurate much. Like, holy hell, like shit, that's so accurate. And I was like, you know what? Even though it's probably been handled by lots of people, I like how this feels and I like how well it reads. So I'm going to keep it as it is. But there are some decks where I have just been like, mm -mm, nope, we are cleansing this because I just don't like how it feels at all. Can a ghost, an earthbound spirit, experience a second death? If so, has it completely ceased to exist? This is one that I'm not going to be able to fully answer because obviously I haven't experienced it myself. But as far as I can tell, that isn't what happens. So if an earthbound spirit is banished from this plane, that doesn't mean they no longer exist. They just go back to the astral. They just go back to the spiritual planes and they can come back across again if that's something that they find that they're able to do. And so you may find that you can banish a spirit and it will keep coming back every single time. And that's because it keeps finding a way back, back, back across again. I tried to say through and across at the same time. And um, so you will find that they do keep coming back again if they can find a way across. So I'm not sure whether you can truly ever get rid of a spirit or whether you just simply remove it from this plane temporarily and then it might choose to come back or maybe it won't. Any advice on ways to do nature work when it's the dead of winter? I live somewhere very cold and snowy and being outdoors in the cold for too long causes pain. Bring nature inside if you can. As simple as a potted plant is a good option, just so you can have that energy in your space so you can connect with it. Especially if you like using herbs and other natural items, any plants that you can bring in that have magical association that you can tap into for your workings could be a good way of doing it. The other way is through artwork and imagery, paintings, photos, anything like that that's going to put you back into that place again so you can continue doing your energetic work. And although the earth is dormant, it's not dead, you know? So there's still going to be energy and nature out there. It just might be a little bit harder to find. But anything that you can bring into your space, whether that is plants that you've gathered through the rest of the year, whether that's potted plants, could be a good option for this one. Is there any type of witchcraft you refuse to do? Um, I don't have any like hard no's when it comes to that. I think it's entirely dependent on the individual situation. So there may well be spells that I simply don't feel comfortable doing in that context, but I might feel comfortable doing them with a different context. And so I'm a little bit flexible in that way. There's nothing that I straight up go, I would never in a million years do that because it really depends on situations and what things are called for. Do you have to charge every single thing in your working or are there things that just are? I feel like I don't know what to charge and which item to tell what to do. So generally speaking, charging it isn't replacing its own energy. So its own energy is still there. That's why we choose the things that we do to add into spellwork and ritual. But for things like crystals, herbs, plants, those kind of things, it's really useful to tell them what to do if they have multiple different associations. So for instance, Rose is used for abundance, prosperity, self-love, familial love, romantic love. Depending on the color, it can mean lots of other things from peace and friendship to mourning and loss and grief. It can represent the full moon. It can also represent the new moon if you're using a black rose or a darker colored rose. So you have lots of different options with that. And that's fine if you want to use it for lots of different things. But if you want to to specifically use it in say a friendship spell, then you're gonna want to let it know which aspect of its energy you want to work with. So generally speaking, if in doubt, think to yourself, does it have its own energy? 
if it does, is that energy going to automatically align with what you want the working to manifest? If it does automatically align, you don't have to charge it. If it has its own energy and doesn't automatically align, as in it's got lots of different associations, you're going to need to charge it or tell it which aspect of itself you want to be working on. If that item doesn't have its own energy, adding it into that working is going to be pointless unless there's something that you're adding into it to make it useful. And that's generally how I work with these things and that's how I find it to be particularly useful, easy. I tend to run through that in my head kind of by default when I'm adding things into a working because that way it's easy to sift through what needs charging and what what doesn't. Do you find that an entity's presence depends on the reaction of the individual? Oh yeah, most definitely. So you might find that a, a spirit that would be normally very passive can become very aggressive if the person interacting with it is very aggressive. So you see this a lot in ghost hunting shows, which is why a lot of them I really don't like because they come into a space, they are being bitchy and demanding and cruel and horrible and they're calling spirits names and then they're wondering why they feel awful when they're in that space. And it's because you are provoking and probably normally very passive spirit to be very aggressive because you are being mean to it. You wouldn't stand two inches away from someone's face and say a bunch of horrible things to them and expect to get a positive response. If you enter into a space and you are completely friendly as a spirit and there is someone who is being, who's absolutely terrified of you and you're just standing here, you're not doing anything that you think would be terrifying, it would make you question yourself. It makes you change how you behave because that person is responding in an overly fearful way for the situation. It makes you question yourself. Same applies when it comes to spirits in that how you interact with them is gonna change that response. If you are nice and open and friendly, if that spirit is naturally nice and open and friendly, then they're gonna match you. If you're nice, open and friendly and that spirit is normally very aggressive, then it's still going to be aggressive. But if you're aggressive to a nice spirit, you might find it's not so nice. So definitely things can change depending on how you respond. And that's why people say, that spirits are very, very responsive to high energies. That can be fear, that can be anger, anything like that has the chance to make them more aggressive or respond in a much stronger way. What are some ways to tell that a spirit is attached to an object? So generally, there's kind of several steps to this. So firstly, when you pick up an object, you might immediately get this like, oh, what is that? <laughs> now that might not be like a, a negative response, but it's gonna feel very different. So you might feel really hot or really cold your arms might go all heavy or tingly. You might find that you feel really sick or really happy or really agitated or really stressed. And then when you put that item down, it goes away. And it might take a while for it to go away, but it goes away. That's a surefire sign that there is something attached to that object. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's something like a spirit. It could just be strong energy. So next step is to have that object and you're going to push out your energy, draw it back in again, energy sensing, right? I have a full video on energy sensing if you would like to learn more about how to do this. That then creates kind of like a, a 3D image, energetic wise of what's around you. Now, usually when a spirit is attached to an object, that object is gonna have a very strange energy response. It's gonna be a very loud response compared to everything else around you. And you might find that that spirit, though it's attached to the object, isn't in the object. 
they're around in that space. And when you do your energy sensing, you are going to be able to pick up on them loud and clear, and it's going to feel exactly like that object felt. They might be sitting on a chair, they might be standing next to the object, they might be standing right next to you. And it's going to vary depending on what the spirit is like. But generally, you're going to be able to pick up on the energy outside of that object as well as inside of it. And also, if that object is in your home, you may well find there are noises, that your pets will respond differently, that the energy feels differently, things start going missing, things are moving, loud noises, those kind of things. And then you're going to have to decide what you want to do from there. This isn't me trying to scare you off though. I have a lovely deck of cards that has a spirit attached to it. He's a lovely gentleman. Well, I say that, he's a bit tricky. Um, and <laughs> not particularly happy now I've said that, but um, he's attached to a deck of cards. And so I like having him around. And so I kept him around. There are other people who maybe wouldn't keep different spirits around depending on how they feel and how they respond to you. Is it a good idea to reuse salt? Like for example, I used it to make a protective circle. Can I reuse it for something else later? No. I'm gonna go with no. Simply, I mean, I would say if you've used it for protection, continue using it for protection. Just bear in mind that because salt is very absorbative with energies, there will come a point where that salt cannot protect anymore. It is just done. It's absorbed so much negative stuff that it just cannot keep going. And in which case you're gonna to want to dissolve it in some hot water, tip it down the drain. Um, no, Don't put salt straight on the earth. You will kill the earth, it's a bad idea. But whether you can use salt for a different thing after you've already used it for one thing, that's gonna depend on what the different thing is and also how long you've used it for because salt doesn't really allow you to charge it with energy the way other things do because it's absorptive. It absorbs in energy and it stores it, but it doesn't let it go again. So really cleansing and protection are probably the two best uses for salt because they offer that drawing in property and protection from energies because it sucks it all into itself so as if in doubt wash it out <laughs> i didn't intend to make that rhyme but if in doubt wash it in some hot water tip it down the drain get some new salt um that way you can be sure when you're using it that it's going to have its full oomph the full oomph behind it <laughs> Book recommendations for baneful magic. So I have, where did I put it? Oh no, this is this is the problem with me organizing. Um, what is it called? What is it called? What is it called? I've spoken about it before. If anyone has been to my lives before, my brain is just mush. I've spoken about this book before. It's something, something in unsavory things. Some, something, something, and unsick. <laughs> this is going to annoy me now, not knowing what it's called. Um, something, something, and unsavory things. Ah, ah, aha, this. Ah, this. It's called Utterly Wicked Curses, Hexes, and Other Unsavory Things. I got a few words right in that. This one is interesting. It's there's things I would change about it and I'm interested to deep dive a little bit more into it. I don't tend to read spell books the way I would read other books because, you know, unless you need a specific spell, you're not going to, you're not going to need it. But let's have a look at the kind of things it has in it. So we have... Um, bum, ba -dum, bum, ba -dum, bum, ba <laughs> Poppets different curses, reversing curses, which is really useful. What else do we have? Cars, businesses, criminals, debts, enemies, gossip, love, uh, protection, relocation, revenge, separation, sleep, workplace woes, there's a lot in here. And I'm, I'm gonna have to fully deep dive through it and see what I would change in it and the things that I would do and the things that I wouldn't do. 
but that could be something to look into if you are interested in this kind of thing. It's obviously not gonna be for everyone, just bear that in mind. I think the cover is also different on it now because I had someone send me their copy. So thank you so much if you sent me your copy. I really, really appreciate it. And let's see, Emma. Emma sent me um, her copy. So thank you so, so much. And I'm gonna need to go through some of the workings in here and see what I like and what I don't like, but that is a good option if you want some more kind of interesting things. And before everyone jumps on the bandwagon of, oh, it's terrible things to do. Um, the important thing to remember here is that you cannot protect against something if you don't know what it is. So even if you are not interested in casting any negative workings at all, it can be incredibly useful to learn how these workings are done. Because if you know how it's done, you know how to undo it. And that can be so useful in magical practice. And I would recommend anyone learn about negative workings, even if they don't plan on doing it themselves, because it just sets you up to be able to undo them if you do need to. Do can you throw salt at a malevolent spirit to harm or destroy it? I mean, you, you might deter it a little bit, but you're not gonna destroy it. And depending on the spirit, they might just laugh at you. Salt can do a lot. Salt is really wonderful for protection. It can help cleanse away unwanted energies. It can help protect against spirits, but it's not gonna destroy them per se. It, it's just gonna deter them and be like, okay, this person has protections up. I'm gonna go somewhere else. I'm a little bit alarmed by this question. Is it okay to eat candles to symbolize you becoming one with it and thus magnifying your intentions tenfold? Please don't eat candles. Candles are not designed to be eaten. Even natural candles are not meant to be eaten and you can cause yourself so much physical medical damage by doing that. So candles are for burning, they are not for eating. When would be a good time, wow, words. When would be a good time to change your Sabbath altar right after it ends, a little while after? You'll alter right after Samhain ends or wait a bit. I typically wait a bit. I am, for reference, setting up my Samhain altar this coming week. I probably would have done it last week, but I was away, so I couldn't. So. I generally wait for the season to change. So in my mind, and I don't know if anyone else will agree with this, in England, Yule is kind of in the wrong time at the moment. Seasons have changed dramatically over the centuries. And whereas Yule was a celebration of the darkest time of the year, now it isn't really the darkest, coldest point in the year. If anything, January and February in England is way worse than December. It's colder, it's darker, more miserable, it's it's just bitter. So for me, I personally extend my Yule celebrations into January because for me, that makes more sense. So I will typically wait a little bit longer after Samhain before I set up my Yule altar just so it makes sense. Oh my goodness, I did not see this. Thank you so, so much. I'm gonna butcher your name, I just know it. Anyame? Anyame. I'm so sorry. Thank you so, so much. And I'm so glad that you enjoy the content. It really means a lot to me. And if you're still on, you are willing to let me know how to pronounce your name properly because I want to get it right. Um, please let me know and, and I will try to do that. Do your celebrations of Christmas and Yule overlap a lot, a, a lot or are they very separate? What are some of your favorite magical traditions for Christmas and or Yule? So some of them overlap. So I set my Christmas tree up every year and on it are a bunch of pagan Yule decorations. And so that's kind of a combined thing. And then I will celebrate Yule basically from the start of December through to the end of January. And that's just because that's when it feels right for me. Christmas is kind of its own standalone day that is separate from everything else. But I know that some people will have Yule logs and things that they will then incorporate into their Christmas celebrations as well. So it's uh, very flexible there. But for me, the main thing 
is the tree. That's the thing that connects them together for me. Do you feel there's any difference in how we compile a grimoire and a book of shadows? Does it really matter? I mean, recently they have been combined into the same thing. Um, oh my goodness, Eleanor, I, I write your name out every month and I go, wow, I love your name. <laughs> your name is so cool. So you can be very proud of having an awesome name. Thank you so much for your support. It really, really means a lot to me. So I'll go back to where, where I was again now. Um, the, the term Book of Shadows and Grimoire has kind of been merged into the same thing recently, but they were never the same thing. So a Book of Shadows is a personal journal of your magical practice. It contains your trials, your spells, your rituals, your divination, the things that went right, the things that went wrong, the things that you're going to alter, the dates of when you did things, how you did them, the things that you used. A Grimoire is a book that is designed to be shared. So it's something that has been compiled in a way that is to be passed on, whether that is to someone in your lineage or whether that is to a random person. So you'll find a lot of grimoires are published today and that's essentially any book. So this is a grimoire and this is a grimoire. It is just a magical teaching that has been written into a book for other people to be able to experience. I don't have a book of shadows on hand, but a book of shadows is designed to document your own practice and it's designed to be for you. And so a lot of people will use the terms interchangeably, but historically they were different things. And really, nowadays you can write in them however you please some people will stick to the more traditional way of doing it some people will just have a free-for-all it's whatever works best for you oh this is an interesting one Wow, I said that sentence so fast, I'm not even sure the words came out in the right order. Can you explain the difference between a watcher and a shade? So I've I've been a bit confused about this over the past few months because people have suddenly started talking about watchers as like different things. I think this might have come from TikTok, honestly. So a shade, they enjoy observing. So as far as I know, anyway, a, a, a shade is a watcher. The terms have been used interchangeably because of their behavior. So shadow people, shades, shadow men, living shadows, some people even call them, are watchers, as in they're just like synonyms for the same thing. So different people will have different terms for them. So one of the folk names for a shade was a watcher because they would watch, they observe, they peer at you around door frames and they watch you around corners and from shadows and dark places. More recently, I've been seeing the term watcher applied to other things. And I'm not sure if that's a TikTok thing. And honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if it was because it's, th these things have really been popularized recently. Yeah, I've, I've never known the term watcher be associated with, I know there's a group of angelic spirits that are called watchers. And I know that a shade is a watcher. That's how they're referred to in folk books and, and folk teachings as a watcher. I've never known the term watcher be used to represent anything other than those two things. So it might just be a location thing because yeah. Yeah, so th that's, that's the other term. So watchers are typically used either for shades or for these fallen angelic spirits from the Book of Enoch. Those are the angelic spirits that I was referring to. Um, that's really the only time I've, I've known them be used so I don't know, it might just be a cultural thing, a difference in location. I'm not sure. Oh no. Oh, it jumped. Oh, I'm gonna have to find where I was again now. <laughs> I hope I wasn't that far away. Okay, I don't think I was that far off, thank goodness. I didn't wanna have to scroll up for ages to find it.
do, 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 do. Oh, do you have any advice for working with a spirit that's in a fandom? Just like you would with any other spirit, something different or special. Advice on how to begin in general, I've never worked with one before. So I'm assuming you mean it's as a form of pop culture magic. So the idea is that a thought form has been created by the collective belief or acknowledgement by a group of people that it exists. So in which case you would work with it the way you would work with any different spirit. The bonus of working with a thought form versus a spirit that is sentient in its own right is that you have a little bit more information about it because it's something that has been created by a group of people. And so that group of people are gonna have information about it as to what it likes and what it doesn't like. And you can then use that. Whereas a lot of pre-made, pre-made spirits is the wrong idea, but, but separate spirits, spirits that don't require humans to exist, it's a little harder to figure out what they like and what they don't like. And it often requires trial and error and communication with people who've worked with them and that kind of thing. Do, do. Where was I? I think I was about here. I don't know where I was. It just jumped. Oh, hi, Phil. <laughs> I didn't even know that Phil was here. I'm so unobservant. Hello. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where on earth I was and I can for the life of me figure out. Oh, any ideas for unclumping new tarot cards? Mine are sticking together badly. So I have never done this, but I had this exact same problem a few months ago and I had someone recommend something, I forget what it's called. Some people said use like, make, like translucent makeup powder or like baby powder. Other people said there's a specific product that you can buy that is used by professional card players, like like magicians who use cards and stuff. And it um, coats the surface to stop them from sticking together. So when they do their card tricks, it's they slide apart instead of getting stuck together because so many decks you'll be shuffling them and like two will be like stuck together. So they like rub the stuff on either side of the card and then um, they will like not stick together anymore. That is what I've been told. I've never used it, but I'm gonna have to give it a go because I have one deck that is driving me up the wall and I actually never ever use it for that exact reason because they just stick together and it's so annoying. Can I enchant something with calm, happy, positive energy to keep me happy, stay calm, etc.? Yeah, you definitely can. So you can get someone else to charge it for you. You can charge it yourself when you're feeling in a really positive mindset, and then you can carry it around with you to help bring some of that energy back in again when you're not feeling that. So that is a good option. Just bear in mind that when you are drawing it back in again, you are draining that object. So then you're gonna have to charge it again and again and again, if that's something that you want to do. If I use a tag lock, a clump of hair, for example, can it be reused or should I, or should I discard it? So in some cases you are going to want to discard it. And in some cases you're going to have to discard it. So if you're burning a tag lock, for instance, that's it. You're not going to get it back. But if you are using a tag lock, for instance, in a poppet, so you've created a poppet to attract you. Ah, fanning powder. That's what it's called. Thank you so much. Um, someone said here, the powder for cards is called fanning powder. Thank you. Um, what was I saying? <laughs> I got distracted. I'm here somewhere. Oh, if tag locks, that's it. So if you're making a poppet and you've added in a tag lock to represent you and it's for yourself and it's simply as a representation, you can then use that again because all you've added it in for is representation. If you have targeted your energy at a tag lock, so if you've been holding a photograph and you're targeting your energy into that photograph as a way of passing it through to them energetically, 
skateboard <laughs> then you're not going to want to use that tag lock again for something else because you've passed energy through it and so there's going to be some remains of that so it really is going to depend on what you're using it for and then you can kind of adapt from there <laughs> I had someone ask what the song was I'm humming. I have absolutely no idea. I, I don't know. I just get classical music in my head and I don't even know why I don't even listen to it. Do you know any chance to call storms? I do. I'm not going to share any in here, mostly because there's a lot that goes behind it. So as I mentioned earlier, when it comes to spells and rituals manifesting, it is essentially a spark. It is something that you're doing. It's that that click that is gonna start energizing that space. But if there isn't anything for that to cling onto, it's not going to manifest. So if you live in an area where you do not have storms, if you live in an area where you do not have rain, like ever, or if you live in an area where there is lots and lots and lots of rain and it's just a given that that's what happens in your area or there's lots of snow, doing a spell to make it 40 degrees Celsius in the middle of winter when it's snowing and it's like minus 30 Celsius is not going to manifest because it doesn't make sense. There's nothing for that spell to cling on to. So there are lots of storm calling and weather spells out there and they're quite controversial in a way because some people don't think that you can do anything at all some people do I used to be a storm practitioner I used to use the energy of storms a lot but from that I know that there needs to be something for it to go off so feel free to look some up see if you can find them lots of spell books have them lots of online websites have them but whether they're going to manifest is really going to be dependent on your area the more people that are there doing the working, the more energy that is behind it. But no matter how much energy that is behind it, if there isn't anything for it to set a, a light, essentially, then it's not going to. You thought I said fanny powder. No, fanning. Fanning, like with a fan. <laughs> Unfortunately, the way I say it sounds not great. <laughs> In books, I feel like they are saying fake it till you make it. Imagine this or stop when it feels right. Am I missing something? Do I develop some sense from this eventually? Yeah, so I personally, and obviously this is just an individual thing, I don't like when people say you have to act like it's already happened. Otherwise it won't manifest. That has never once worked for me in my entire magical practice for one simple reason. If you all, if you're acting, you're behaving and you're thinking like you already have it, what is there to manifest? You are telling the universe that you already have it. Why is, why is the energy going to help you get something if you already have it? So I've never, maybe that's just my mindset. I've never once had this whole thing of you have to, Act like you've already got it in order to get it. In magical practice, I have never once had success with that. And that's probably just a me thing because lots of other people have great success with it. I don't get it. Something I've never understood. For me, I always come at spell work and ritual saying, this is what I'm doing to work towards this. I would like to achieve this. Are you able to assist me with this? Or energetically, can you help line everything up so that this will manifest for me? That's how I come at spell work and ritual because then I'm saying, you know, this is what I'm willing to do. This is what I'm working towards. I am really want to achieve this. Can you help? Rather than saying, I already have this, therefore I should just have it. Because for me, that just doesn't work. But when it, so that's, that's been something that you're gonna have to play around with because different practitioners feel very differently about that. The other way of thinking is this whole, you know, stop when it feels right. You see this a lot with tarot reading. You see this a lot with energy. That is something that just comes with time. It is something that when you've done a few workings or dozens of workings, however many it is, it is, it's something that you just get after a while. And at first it feels kind of weird and you're just kind of guessing. But over time, I have found that kind of trial and error, you know how much energy needs to be in something in order for it to manifest. 
therefore at that point you know that it's good to go and that is something that just goes any news relating to the book club none yet i've been so busy i've not been able to do anything on it so that if it would if it's going to happen would happen in the new year i just from now to christmas i just do not <laughs> have absolutely any time free to be able to to sort all of that out so it's definitely something that i'm gonna have to look into going forwards let's see where i was oh it jumped I don't know where that came from either. <laughs> another random song. Another day, another random song. If a candle keeps extinguishing by itself, what could it mean? So this one is going to depend on circumstances. So there's lots of reasons why a candle will extinguish itself. So we'll start with the mundane first. If the wick is too small for the candle, the wax will flood the wick. That is probably the simplest way of, of explaining that one. And it usually happens in candles that haven't been made quite right. So the wick is designed to burn wax at a certain diameter around it. And if the wax is wider than the candle is able to burn, it cores down the center. That's why a lot of cheap candles will have like loads of wax building up around it. So if that wax is not right for the wick that's been chosen, or there's too much wax for the wick to burn away, it will flood over the top of the wick and suffocate the wick. And then you'll have to like dig the wick out and relight it again super mundane reason why that might be happening and you can fix it just by kind of scooping out some of the molten wax and that way it won't keep snuffing it out and if it has snuffed out wait for it to cool get in with a spoon and just kind of scrape some of the wax out and it shouldn't happen again fingers crossed another reason why it might happen is that the container is not suitable for a candle and so not enough oxygen gets in and it snuffs the candle out that is another one that there isn't really much you can do about it unfortunately that candle might just be a goner Magically, however, if you're finding that you light a candle and even though you've given it every opportunity to burn, it keeps putting itself out, the wick is still standing. It's a wide open container. There's lots of oxygen there. There's lots of chance for it to burn and it will not light. That either means that your working is done. So your working is burned and burned and burned and it gets near-ish to the bottom. Then all of a sudden, even though there's lots of wax there and there's lots of wick, it won't light. Sometimes that is a sign that that working is done. It doesn't need to continue. So it won't let you relight it. If at the very start of that working, it won't stay lit no matter what you do. It could mean that that working is not something that you want to be doing. Your spirit, your ancestors, whoever it is that's around you is saying, mm -mm, no, we're not doing this. And generally you will have felt something before that point to say, no, we're not doing this. <laughs> and in which case that is your sign to be like, okay, I will reconsider it and then talk about it think it, do it again in the future, if it feels right. Do. Is it necessary to cleanse a cauldron before its first use? You can, but you don't need to unless you feel as though you need to. Most of my cauldrons I don't cleanse. There's one, actually no, I didn't even cleanse that one. There's one that I had that didn't feel quite right, but I use it for negative for like banishing workings so that's fine like I didn't need to cleanse it for that so go off what it feels like if you feel the need to cleanse it cleanse it you can use smoke I wouldn't necessarily use water if it's cast iron because you will essentially just start rusting that cauldron but um energy cleansing sound cleansing smoke cleansing are all options if you do feel that you need to though do remember cauldron is a symbol of transformation so you can take that energy that you don't like and you can energetically transform it in that cauldron to something that's really good so that's an option as well do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. I always thought an egregore, a tulpa, and a servitor were the exact same things. Like, a thought form were the same things. Maybe they aren't, but I've... 
always known them and everyone that I've ever spoken to about it, like teacher-wise, has always used the same term to describe them all. It's just the extent of them is different, but it's the same process behind them. Should I smoke, should you smoke, burn, eat or drink mugwort? Which one of the methods mentioned gives you the strongest effect? Okay, let's put it this way. Don't smoke, burn, eat or drink anything unless you entirely understand the dosage that is required, the medications that you are taking, how it might interact with medications and medical conditions and or if you have a reaction to it. It's just better to not and unless you, and if you already know that, then you probably wouldn't be asking the question, is all I can say on that one is, any plant is really important that you make sure that you do your research on it, that you get everything right about it, because plants like mugwort, like St. John's wort, there's so many out there that can cause really strong reactions, both with your own biology and also with medications, health conditions and anything else. So I would recommend going to speak to a herbalist and getting that information from them first. And then, cause they'll probably likely, especially if they're in this spiritual world, be able to answer your question whilst you're knowing the dosages that are suitable for your body and all of that stuff. Da, 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 do, do, do. Oh no, it jumped again. Oh, do you have any recommendations for books on the tree oh, I do. Now it's a case of where is it? <laughs> where is the book? And that is the big question. Um, uh, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's here somewhere. It's, it's called Tree Magic. Tree, 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 tree. <laughs> it's here somewhere. I don't, I, I don't know where it is. It's called Tree Magic, I think. And the cover has a tree and then the trunk of the tree is, it's plaited together to go to the roots. <laughs> I don't know if anyone is able to know what that, um, what that book is. But I have it somewhere and I don't know where I've put it. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I hope that, that we can figure out what it is. Let, let me actually search for this. Tree magic. Oh, um. Oh, it's called Celtic Tree Magic. Oum Law and Druid something. It kind of gets cut off. Druid Mysteries, that is the book that I really like for working with the Oum. And it's it was the first book that I got on the subject and it is still, to this day, my favorite. <laughs> yeah, see, th this is what works for me as well, as well. Just Rose said, if I really want something, I concentrate on it and work to get it. Maybe that's just common sense, but it always works for me. Yeah, that that's how I'm like with it. Like um, Alicia said something similar about how can I act as if I already have it when I've never experienced it before. This is why I think a lot of the wording in modern witchcraft books can kind of confuse people. The whole idea of think and act like you've already got it. But it's like, how am I meant to think and act like I already have something if I've never had it, never experienced it. I have no idea what it feels like. I'm working towards it. I don't already have it. How am I meant to know what it feels like to have it when I don't already have it? And it can get really, really confusing. So you can try and anyone can try that technique of, um, of acting like they already have it and see how it works for them. But don't be dissuaded. As a lot of books say, like you have to do it like this. You don't have to do it like that. If saying that you are working towards something works better for you, then that is what you need to do in your own practice if it gets you the results that you want. Is there a quick way to ch cleanse a space with loose incense without the charcoal disc? I can't find it anywhere where I am. So it depends. Do you need to be using the incense? 
because there are lots of ways to cleanse without using loose incense. I have two videos on them that could be really useful. One is how to cleanse with smoke and how to cleanse without smoke. You can use incense, loose incense on an oil warmer with a tea light under it, but you're not going to get the smoke which most people use to cleanse with. So if you can't get hold of the charcoal discs, try using another form of cleansing until you're able to. You might end up finding that you prefer another way of cleansing anyway, but if you want something with the smoke, you're going to need to find something other than loose incense if you can't get hold of charcoal. Do, do, do. Oh, it jumped. Hmm. And your books like to hide a lot, don't they? They do. The, the, the problem is, is that I, I, I'm missing a bookcase. So I, I need to get an extra bookcase. So I put things in piles on the floor with the intention of reading them and putting them away. And the problem is, is that when I do the live streams, I move all of the books so you can't see them like stacked by the side of the bookcase. And I moved it and I don't know where I put it. And yeah, things go missing. I, I keep being asked for a fairy, a fairy book video. And I read like 25 books on fairies. And uh, then I lost the notebook that they were in. And now I don't know where it is. So <laughs> um, my books go missing a lot, a lot, a lot. Oh yeah, Ray, oh, Ray, Ray Ravenclaw, I love your name, said if you take aspirin, that if you take aspirin, there are even herbal interactions like ginseng or fever few are not good with simple aspirin as it can thin your blood too much. Yeah, that's the thing. I think it's really important when, when looking at plants and plant magic and, and plant energies is that same saying, I say it a lot, or at least I used to, just because it's natural doesn't mean it's safe. And a lot of people think that plant medicine is safe and therefore you can take whatever you want, however often you want and in however high a dosage you want. And that's just not, it's not true. Um, plants are very, very powerful and they can have some serious, um, serious interactions that can cause people a lot of problems. So if you're interested in herbal magic, go to a trained herbalist. And I don't mean someone who got a qualification off the internet. I mean like a legit person who has spent years training with herbalists to be a medical herbalist. Because there's a big difference between a magical herbalist and a medical herbalist. They can cross over and you can have a medical herbalist that's also a magical herbalist and vice versa. But the training in medical herbalism is a lot more restrictive. There are think, you know, classes that you have to go to, exams that you have to take, certifications that you have to get in order to be a magical a medical herbalist. And so if you are wanting to, to take any natural herbal medicine, please always go to someone with the qualifications and the certifications that are a legal requirement in most countries to have. That way they are able to keep you safe in what you're doing. Living in America, do you think the Fae here are different from the Fae where you are? I've tried to research different types of Fae from books and I don't believe they are talking about those here. So this is why it's really useful to look into the mythology and legends of the land and especially in America of the people who lived there before. And you may find that the names change, but the spirits are the same or similar. So you will find this in lots of areas around the world that spirits have their own zones that they that they live in. And so you'll find that, say, in England, we have certain types of fae that are also found on the European continent that may well be found in North America as well. And some people brought their fae with them when they moved. Sometimes the Fae are just there in the land and they are the same, but they are given different names. And sometimes spirits are different, much like how animals are different in different places. The animals on the North American continent are going to be different in a lot of cases to the animals in Europe. And so it's about looking into the mythology, the legends of the people of the land as well as the land itself. So you can get a better understanding of the kind of spirits that are there and how you can honor them if you choose to do so. So it's more difficult because there's a lot of overlaying of 
different traditions and beliefs and a lot of things that have happened that we don't necessarily see so much over here. So it is a little bit trickier, but looking into the mythology of place rather than fairy books might give you a better understanding of what you're dealing with. Do you use pendulums? If so, how best do you use it and how should I ease into it? I love using pendulums. So best, I, it's, it's a difficult one. There's no best way really to do anything. But I have found, do I have, I have one. <laughs> I have stuff lying everywhere. So, oh, pendulum, okay. So best advice for pendulums is, this is my, my favoritest pendulum. She, she's gotten a little bit knotted. I'll have to, how have you managed to do that? She's managed to get herself, anyway. So best advice is hold the end of the pendulum between your thumb and forefinger like that. So you're pinching it on the flat bit. So not, not like right on the end. It's like part way down your finger and then loop it over your forefinger. So it hangs like this. This is a really easy, comfortable way of holding it. It's, she's not gonna slide. You know, she's, I'm holding her quite stable, but she can also move freely. And then I will, every time, ask a yes and a no. And because this is working with yourself, so we're not working with spirits right now, we're working with ourselves. Your micro movements, which is what makes your hand jump and move, it's what makes the pendulum move, are micro movements that you are creating, that is tapping in to your subconscious, your psychic abilities, your, the stuff that goes on behind the scenes that you often push out. The pendulum helps to attract those forwards. So if you're just getting started, start with just asking yourself questions. So you're just asking your inner self. So you've gotten a yes. So say for example, if a yes is backwards and forwards, a no might be left to right, or you might find that a yes is clockwise and a no is counterclockwise. Once you know the answer to that, that's what your pendulum likes this time, you might find that your pendulum has different answers the next time. So make sure that you ask each time and then you're gonna wanna ask your questions and keep track of whether it's a yes or whether it's a no. Sometimes pendulums will have a maybe. For me, my pendulums maybe is like a, kind of jiggles. It's like, oh, I don't know the answer to this one or ask me again later. And so start with the inner stuff. Start with asking yourself before you start asking to connect with spirits, if that is what you want to do with pendulums. I forgot, I've lost where the question is. I think it jumped. I think it jumped while I was doing that. But um, yeah, best way to ease into it, start with working with yourself. Anything else is simply a bonus. I pulled her a little bit too hard and she's not very happy with me. So I'll have to, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll have to um, fix that later, make her feel a bit better. Okay, next one. Have <laughs> Is your family okay with you practicing witchcraft? Have you told them yet? I mean, they've known for, since basically the start. <laughs> so this is like, I think, I think it's been at least 10 years, at least since they found out probably considerably longer actually. I'm, I never bothered hiding it. Like if they weren't okay with it, then that's fine. But like, it's not their life. You know what I mean? So I'm lucky that my family is pretty chill with it. They're like, okay, whatever you want, that's fine. <laughs> so yeah, they're fine with it. I'm, I'm lucky in that regard. Cause I know that a lot of people aren't so lucky. Do, 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 do. If I don't, I'm noticing a lot of duplicate questions. So if I've already answered a question, I'm not gonna re-answer it again. And if I've already done a full video on it, then there is a full video on the channel. And I'll I'll usually say that if, if I have, um, generally anyway, unless I completely miss the question. And sometimes I just don't know the answer to a question. And if I genuinely cannot give any advice at all on a question, then I will usually not answer it because there's no point in me just waffling out nonsense, you know? Have you finished building your workspace? Will we get a tour? When it's done, probably at the minute, it's still not done. I am in the process of trying to sort out a wall of shelves, um, but it is now winter. 
well, it's not technically, but it feels like it. It's wet and it's cold. And it's really hard to cut wood outside when it's wet and cold and you don't have a cover. So all of my herbal jars of all of my herbs are just on the floor. Um, so I need to like get this entire wall done so that I can put them up and then, then it will be done. It's literally the last thing. And I've been doing this since July, 2021. It's only been a year and a half. <laughs> so I'm desperately hoping that I can get that done ASAP because I'm fed up of all of my herbs being on the floor. Yes, on the Goodreads account, I struggle to find anyone reviewing witchy books. Okay, I will I will work on doing a Goodreads, Goodreads account. I've never really thought of doing it before, but yeah, if that's something that you would like me to do, when it's done, I will post the link to the account on the community tab on the channel. So if you are subscribed, it should come up for you or you can manually click the community tab. If you aren't subscribed and you would like witchy book recommendations and reviews, then you can subscribe if you want. That'd be great. I'm trying to get to 160,000 and I'm so close. Um, so yeah, I'm, I will try and do that because if I'm already doing the reviews and I'm already writing down the information as I'm reading it, I may as well post it as a, an actual review. Do you summon demons? I personally don't, but that's simply because it's not my style of practice. I have absolutely nothing against it. I don't think it's bad in any way. Can be incredibly good actually for lots of people. It's just not really my thing. Ooh, um, some fae or other following me and taking slash refusing to return my items. They took my brand new unused tarot deck. It's taken a bunch of my jewelry and several other items. So this seems like you need to do some serious damage control. You, I, I don't know if it's been, if it's purposeful, probably not, probably completely accidental. It sounds like you have annoyed uh, fae and they are telling you that they are annoyed by whatever you've done. If that that could be the the moving of an item that was significant to them, that could be something that you said, it could be not giving an offering, give an offering, something sweet, something sweet that they will like, milk, um, sweetened milk, sugared milk, um, sugar bread, bread in general, cakes, these kind of things they really like. Leave it as an offering, 24 hours later, return it to the earth. Could be a good way of being like, I done fucked up. I don't know how I done fucked up, but I did. So there you go. I wouldn't necessarily verbally apologize, but giving that offering could be a good appeasal and, and saying like, you know, here is an offering. Can I please have my things back now? Thank you. And seeing what happens, seeing what happens, um, because I've had it where I've had things disappearing and I just ask for it and I get it back. Uh, so that's a good option as well. But an offering in this instance sounds like might it might be required. Do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. How can I improve my psychic development? That would be acknowledgement. And I know I say it every live stream and people always get annoyed because they're like, that's not fast enough. But <laughs> truly acknowledgement is the best way of doing it. Start acknowledging the things that you are seeing, hearing, smelling, experiencing, whether that is dreams, create a dream journal, whether that is in meditations, make a meditation journal, whether that is phantom smells, you're just sitting, like I get them a lot when I'm in this room in particular because a lot of my stronger protections are not in this space. And so I will oftentimes have phantom smells, like. I don't wear that much perfume per se. It gives me headaches. So I'll randomly get this really strong smell of perfume and I'm like, whoa, where did that come from? There's no perfume that I own. And within seconds it's gone, like, it just disappears. And you don't have to be saying to yourself, wow, that must have been a spirit. Cause that's often a really hard jump for people, especially when they're just getting started. And it isn't always true, but start saying to yourself, that was weird. I just smelt, insert whatever it is you just smelled. Or, wow, that was weird. I'm sure I just saw a black shape in the corner of my eye, but now it's gone. You don't have to jump. 
you know, you don't have to take that big jump to be like, wow, I just saw a dark shape out of the corner of my eye. There must be a spirit in my house. That's a lot for a lot of people. But just that little acknowledgement that, oh, I just heard knocking. That's strange. That acknowledgement starts to teach your brain that this is something you want to pay attention to. These are things that you want to acknowledge, remember, and recognize. And over time, you'll start noticing that you recognize more and more and more things. Because our brain's default response in our society is to brush everything off. You know, oh, I saw a weird shadow out the corner of my eye. I must just be tired. Even though you know you aren't tired. It's that kind of default response that we often have. Or, oh, I just smelt this strange sp- smell. I, I must just be imagining things. And it's the way our society is set up nowadays to kind of erase these things. So by acknowledging them, you tell your brain that this is something you want to remember. It's something you want to focus on and it develops from there and it kind of snowballs. So to start off with, it's a really slow progress and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes on. And that's the same thing with dreams and remembering dreams as well. Same applies. Oh my goodness, thank you so much, Susan. <laughs> thank you so much. It's something I, I never I, I never really push in, in the live streams, but thank you so much. I really appreciate it. If you need any DIY help, let me know. Thank you, Phil. Uh, unfortunately, my dad is kind of taking the reins on this one and I am, I am just like holding out hope that I will end up with shelves at the end of it. <laughs> That's the hope anyway. Do you listen to the band is it Hailstorm? I the fact that I don't even know how to say their name, Hailstorm, Hailstorm, Hailstorm. Um, probably not. I let me let me look them up. The problem I have is that I listen to a lot of bands, but I often have no idea what their name is. So like, I might recognize their music, but I will have absolutely no idea who they are like, as a person. I mean, they seem like the kind of band I would listen to. So the fact that I haven't is alarming. (laughs) Okay, I'm gonna have to check them out and I will check back with you and let's see whether I like them. I mean, everything looks like the kind of stuff I would listen to. Anyway, (laughs) I'll put that one as a firm maybe. What is your favorite glamour trick? I don't really use glamour magic very much. I'll The max that I will do is the invisible, like the invisibility workings, which is in effect a form of glamour magic where you are changing your appearance by making you less noticeable. That's about as much glamour magic as I do. I just, I, I've never really dabbled with it that much. It's something I need to look into a lot more. Oh, this is really interesting. Hi Hearth, recently my guides slash deities have gotten after me for over-worshipping and not asking for things in return. How can I break bad habits of my past religious and spiritual beliefs? That's really interesting because usually it's the other way around. Usually people are over-requesting and they are not offering anything in return. So maybe the way of doing this is to invest that into something else. So find something, any time that you're like, I feel the need to do this, even if it's not like a need, even if it's like this default response, I feel like you almost need to invest that time into something else, something that might benefit your magical or spiritual practice in some some way. So whether that is tending to a plant or maybe that is creating a servitor, and when you have that feeling of, I, I, I feel like I should be worshipping or I feel like I should be devoting my time to something, you can interact with your servitor, strengthen your bond with your servitor because the more time you spend and interact with your servitor, the stronger and more connected to you it becomes and the more you're able to get out of having a servitor or have some plants and spend that time connecting with those plants, you're still gonna be benefiting your magical practice. You're still giving something back in that way, but you aren't worshiping in the way that maybe you're used to. You're instead connecting with 
which is sacred in itself, but it isn't worshipping in the way that you might be used to. So that could be a good option. Um, I don't really know what else to offer because it's very unusual for people to be doing it this way. Usually people are very far the other way. They're over requesting, under um, offering, whereas you're very much the other way around. Let's see, where was I? Best books on discussing the Fae and Fae types. Hmm. <laughs> I will have a look, see. I, I keep getting up today, but it's... It, it's just because it makes it easier when I have a physical copy of the book. So, we have this one. We have... Oh, I think this is the one I was thinking of. Oh, maybe it was this one. Or it could be this one. Okay. Oh. I have a few options. Let's run through some of these. I forget exactly which one it is. So, the fairy faith in Celtic countries. Did I even tell you what the question was? The question was about favorite books about different types of fairies. I'm not sure if I even said the question out loud. Um, one of my favorite books to read is the fairy faith in Celtic countries. This is actually a new copy. This isn't even my copy. How did I end up with this? My copy is battered. This is like pristine. Um, I think it might have been a shop, my the shop copy that I just never sold. Um, so this one is all about kind of first or secondhand experiences with fair folk. And so it doesn't give you like the specific names of them. It gives people's experiences. <laughs> Next shirt idea. Oh, hi, Phil. Wait, this has got a, has this got a pen in it? It's got a fucking pen in it. Why does it have a pen in it? Okay, okay. That book has a pen in it. Um, I don't think this was the one I was thinking of. No, this isn't the one that I was thinking of. No, it's not this one. Is it this one? I need to. I need to reread all of these so that I can. Ah, this. This was this. Was this one? Okay, so this is. The Witch's Guide to Fairy Folk by Adane McCoy. And in the back of this book, it's not the entire book, I, I really want to reiterate that. It's just a section at the back of the book, it's called Fairies of the World. And inside it says like a Afrites, information about them, the land of origin, all of that. So like Alvin, Land of origin, Netherlands. Other origins, non-known. Other names, Ottoman Mana. I don't speak any other languages, I'm afraid. Element, water, appearance and temperament, time most active, law, where to find them, how to connect, magical and ritual help. And um, yeah, so we have here Boggarts, Scotland, other origins, non-known. Other names, hobgoblins, goblins, goblins, the boogeyman, boogies, padfoot, boggins, hobbers, gobs, and blobs. Um, element, earth, appearance. Ah, so in a previous video, people were asking me about how I saw um, boggarts, because I have had many experiences with boggarts. I just closed the book by accident and I'm never gonna be able to find it again. Um, <laughs> luckily it's alphabetical, so hopefully I'll be able to. And like the way they, the way you're going to perceive fair folk is going to depend on the individual because it's a, it's a bit like people, right? You can describe a person, you know, they are, they are really tall. They have two arms and two legs. Generally, they will have hair on their head, which varies in length, but the actual fine details are going to vary individual to individual. So this bogged information goes as follows, it says, the Boggart is a male dwarf fairy with a squat and distorted form. He is a cousin of the friendly house brownie, but his intentions are very different. Whereas a brownie will adopt a home for the joy of offering his help and mutual support, a Boggart will adopt a house just for the sheer delight of destroying things. They are very ill-tempered and greedy. My experiences with Boggarts has been that they are very short, greying, think Schmeagol, think, um, uh, What's his name? What is his name? My precious. What what the, what the fuck is his name? Um, <laughs> from Lord of the Rings. Um, they look a bit like that. Long Gollum. 
oh my god it's not my day today thank you very much phil for that embarrassment um <laughs> i'm not blaming you for me forgetting it i'm blaming me for forgetting it and you reminded me of it um so they have long forearms shorter back legs hunched over that's that's the the boggets that i've seen different places they're gonna vary they're gonna have different hair lengths different variations in their physical form so this one's a really interesting for that one so that is a book on that subject and i will this book of pile of books next to me is getting bigger and bigger and more and more precarious um how do i know if i've spotted a fairy so that's kind of a tricky one because fairies look very different so a fairy is essentially a classification so it's a bit like fish it's a classification they all all fairies fit under this category because they all have similar enough characteristics that make them family in the sense of like a family in the animal kingdom and so lots of spirits of different varieties fall under the fairy umbrella but not all spirits are fairies so it really comes down to practice I've had a lot of time to work with the fairies. I've worked with them for basically my entire life. And so I have a good understanding of how they work and how I feel when they're around. So I can usually tell the difference between say, a land white, an elemental, a fairy and a demon. I can generally always tell the difference between them, but that's purely down to experience more than anything else. It's down to that that practice of interacting with them so it really does come with time as with psychic abilities it's about acknowledgement acknowledge that you've seen or experienced something keep it you can keep a record of it if you like and it will build over time and then you'll be able to have an understanding of how you feel when they're around um bum, ba -dum, bum, ba -dum, bum, ba. I asked you about boggarts, which we possibly call pale crawlers. And then someone else says that they, oh, that might be more than two meters tall. That's interesting because boggarts here are small, maybe three feet off the ground, perhaps. Not particularly big, very aggressive. So it could just be cousins, you know, different people in different places. It could be something similar. It could be the same, just different in a different area. Who knows? Can fairies shape shift? Yes. Um, some, not all. So as with everything, different individuals are going to have different talents and different individual varieties are going to have different abilities. So brownies, in my experience, can disappear. Like they just vanish. They're still there, but you can't see them anymore. They're just gone. Boggarts can alter their appearance to blend in with their surroundings. But there are many documented cases of people experiencing fairies that do shapeshift. Um, particularly higher fae are more able to change their form. So it's something that some can do, but not all. Assume that they can, even if they can't, <laughs> is generally how I would go about it. Always assume that they are more um, significant, able, then they might be. That way you can just keep yourself safe. What happens if I accidentally pick up, pick up a fairy gift? So I feel like this has been made a much bigger deal on it, on TikTok than it is in the real world. So fairy gifts are pretty rare. They are not commonplace, really. And it's going to depend on circumstances. So generally a fairy gift is given when you have been interacting and connecting with the fair folk. And in some cases, a fairy gift is perfectly acceptable to take, especially if it is something that has been agreed upon. You have given them something in return for them giving you something. That's a fair trade. So in which case, those situations, it's perfectly fine to take a fairy gift because it's part of an agreement. You have already made that agreement. But when it's not okay is when it's an object that belongs to a fairy and you've taken it inadvertently maybe and then they're gonna get really pissed or it's a fairy gift that's been left by a tricky fae who wants you to essentially be dragged into a contract of oh you took something that's mine therefore you owe me in which case 
give that item back again, return it to the earth with an offering. So that's usually something like milk, preferably sweetened milk or um, bread, cake, those kind of things. Leave that out with the item. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything other than that. Just put it down, leave it be and leave. And that way you've essentially nullified it. You've gone, okay, I took something that I wasn't meant to take. I I am not interested in getting into anything with you. I give you this in response and I hope that it is a good enough offering to not be sucked into this essentially. And you just leave it be, leave it be at that point. Generally though, Fairy gifts are really rare. Like I've seen people on, I mean, no hate to TikTok. Like I think there can be many, many amazing creators on that platform. And I know that there's lots of amazing creators on that platform, but there are some that I don't necessarily agree with and that's completely fine as well. But fairy gifts, pretty unusual. And a lot of people saying that like, finding an acorn is a fairy gift and finding a plucked flower is a fairy gift. And like, ultimately it's, is it a fairy gift or is it just something that's in nature? Like a child could have picked a flower and left it on a bench. That doesn't make it a fairy gift. That just means that a child left it there. You know, there's usually fae gifts are very out of place. So they are something that's very unusual for the area that you would never normally expect to see. And they're in a really weird place that no one else can typically get to. And they're usually targeted at you. So they're in a place that's really strange. So if you're working with brownies, for instance, and one has left you a gift, it might be a dried flower from a place you don't know, that you've never seen this flower before in your entire life, and you found it on the top shelf of a bookshelf that you've not looked at for years. That is more likely to be a fey gift than like an acorn that you found on your front doorstep that could very well have just blown there during the wind on the street. You know what I mean? Like they're usually a lot more obvious than people give them credit for. So don't be too concerned about it. Like be cautious, but not fearful is the best way I can put it. Um, Here's another inquiry. Do you actually listen to pagan music? If so, do you use them as meditation or in spiritual practice? I, I listen to unusual music. Some people call it pagan music, um, meditation music, Celtic music, whatever it is. I, I listen to it in my day-to-day life. I actually have a playlist. Well, there's a few playlists. Um, I have a playlist on my channel that you can, it's not my playlist, it's a playlist of someone else. Love the music on there. So there's that. There's also a playlist. It's on Spotify as well as on YouTube. It's called Keep Music Pagan. Love it. That's my favorite one that I will listen to all of the time. And I listen to that when I'm doing, um, when I'm preparing for ritual work. I don't listen to it during ritual work. And I will listen to that in just my daily life as well. What I saw, bright gold wings, so, so bright, blinding gold, gold, fluttering upwards in the trees about the size of a dragonfly. It wasn't fast moving wings like a bee, more slow like a bird. Is it a fairy? Um, I mean, maybe. It's, not all fairies are small. Actually, most fairies aren't small or pretty or have wings or anything like that. So first instinct would be completely remove your idea of what a fairy is out of your mind because they don't really look anything like that. Um, It could have been a fae. It could also just be exactly that, a dragonfly. That's what it could have been. So lots of options there. I would say don't, I wouldn't assume that it is, Um, but I'm not, you know, ruling it out completely. Any advice on where to find authentic handmade Celtic coin replicas from the Roman Britain time period? Wait, what? I'm confused. Surely that doesn't work. Authentic replicas from the Roman Britain time, but Celtic coins. I'm so confused. I, My brain does not comprehend that sentence. Are you after real Celtic coins or coins from the Roman period 
or replicas of Celtic coins or replicas of coins from the Roman period. I'm confused. If in doubt, go to Etsy um, because you can find so many things there by small creators who are replicating things like this, usually for collectors or cosplayers or even um, like reenactors often use things like this. So you could well find copies or replicas of these coins from these kind of um, medieval reenactment or, or just reenactment um, sellers. That could be a good option. If you're after the, the real thing, you might struggle because a lot of them are in collections. I know that litter angers the fae, so clearing an area of garbage and disposing of it properly is a good way of giving an offering. It is, yeah. It's not going to be for every fae, but for especially those that reside in areas that do get very cluttered. Um, it could be a good alternative to giving an offering. Do, do, do. Ever since I was a child, I could sense when a loved one would get hurt or worse, but could never see who through dreams. Can I build on this to be able to see better? Yes, dream journals. Because that way, anything that you forget when waking up, you will start to train yourself to remember. So it might be that you see more of what's going on, but because you aren't remembering that section, you aren't retaining that information in order to recall it later. So dream journals are a great option. Da, da, da. Do you have a favorite spell book or a book you can think of with accessible or ranging spells? Unfortunately, I don't really use spell books. I have a few that are kind of <laughs> but generally speaking, I would steer away from spell books and aim more for looking into different kinds of techniques and then building your spells from that. I know that there's dragon magic, but is there any other magic specific to other animals? I would really love to work with wolves, but not sure if I have to work with other things as well. So the big difference here is that dragon magic works with the spirits of dragons. So dragons as spiritual beings, because that's what they are, they're spirits. When it comes to working with wolves, you're more likely going to have to work with their archetype, their representation on earth, how their society is and how they interact with others and the world around them. You can do some, now, it's, it's called shape-shifting, but it isn't shape-shifting like, you know, teen wolf or something. It's essentially like mentally becoming and seeing through the eyes of another animal, another person. It, it's not a physical transformation in any way. It allows you to connect with the spirit of the collective animal in a way that allows you to attune into them during spell work and ritual, which could be a good option if that's something that you are interested in. And to do that, you don't have to work with anything else if you don't want to. If wolves are what you want to work with, then you can just work with them. You don't have to work with anything else. Is there a way I can make amulets for others, charge them and program them and give the recipients a way to activate them in a simple way? Generally, you don't need to activate them if you've if it's like an amulet or a charm or a talisman, something like that, all you would have to do is charge the object. So you aren't like charging you, you are just charging the object to attract in or push away. So whether that's to attract in good things or push away negativity. And then just by that person having that item on them, that is releasing that energy over time. So you don't, they don't need to activate them if they want, they can say some words over it in order to charge it more after the fact, but it will just gradually release that energy over time. Oh, it jumped again. <laughs> oh no, I think I, I think I was about here. Yeah, I've got to be about here. Do you believe in magical gifts? I believe that some people are more adept at certain aspects of magical practice than others. Some people will have psychic dreams and premonition dreams. Some people are particularly good at scrying and some people are great at working and seeing spirits. I think that 
they often run in bloodlines. You'll often find that empathy, not empathy as in I feel bad for someone, more like I feel what they're feeling kind of empathy runs in families, often psychic gifts runs in families. That doesn't mean that if you don't have those gifts, you can never learn them. It's, it's just like a step up in one aspect of magical practice, but someone without those gifts can still get to the same point with practice and with time and with patience. So I, I do think that some people are more adept at certain aspects, but that applies to everything. You know, some people are naturally really good at art. You can still become good at art. It's just not quite as natural to you. It's something you have to work on a little bit more. How do I know if demons are affecting my thoughts and emotions? Usually they won't be. Mostly because demons really don't care most of the time. Like I've, the only times I've ever had problems with demons is when I've entered into their territory without realizing it. And then they're like, get out of my space. Like, leave me alone. Generally demons don't care enough to be impacting thoughts and emotions. There are other spirits who might, but Oftentimes it could be energies more than demons. And really there isn't much way to know because there's a lot of crossover. You, you'll often find that, that mental health will affect emotions and thoughts. You'll find that energies will affect it and spirits will affect it. If in doubt, start with the physical and the psychological and then progress onto everything else afterwards, just so you can cover all of your bases so that you know that you're doing things in the right step and you're not gonna make things worse. Do you like the illustrator Brian Froud? His pictures of fairies resemble the way you portray them. Let's have a look. I've never seen their work at all. Let's have a look. Oh my goodness. I love it. <laughs> I love it. To the point where, wait, wait a minute. Wait, I need to check this. Hang on, I'm up again. It's over here. Let me check something. I have a deck on fairies. Oh, here. Who did this? Okay, I have this deck, right? And it doesn't like me. This is the deck that gives me nosebleeds. So I'm gonna be really quick when I look at this because I I don't want to get a nosebleed. Oh, I hate it. Some decks just, oh, I don't like it. Like some of these cards literally still have my blood on them from the last time I used them. Mm, not again. No, I don't think it's the same illustrator. Um, but they look very close. I actually prefer his illustrations. They're amazing. They are so like how I perceive the Fae. So if you want to know how Fae look, Brian Froud, I need to put this deck down. I can like feel it in my face. Ooh, oh, let's put you back over there. I've had people say like, why don't you just get rid of the deck? And it's like, I'm not gonna get rid of it because it's, I don't wanna put that on anyone else either. But equally, like it's a part of my like magical journey. So I keep them on the top shelf so I don't have to interact with them. <laughs> oh my God, thank you so much, Laura. Oh, thank you so much. You're so nice for doing that. I really, really appreciate it. Okay, let, I'm gonna see where I was. I was up here somewhere. I think I was about here. <laughs> Have you ever been to the Museum of Witchcraft in Boss Castle? No, and I really wish that I could. I don't often go to Cornwall. It's not something that I do very often. I have, however, got the print that was made. You can't even freaking see it. The gold print over there. <laughs> it is, um, you see it in my videos anyway. That is the... Um, Museum of Witchcraft print for their 70th anniversary, I think, something like that. So I like supporting them. I also get some books from there as well. They do some great traditional witchcraft books. If you if you are in the area and you want traditional witchcraft books, the Boss Castle Witchcraft Museum. But I, I'm going to go one day and I'm very looking forward to the day that I get to go because that would be so amazing. 
da, da. The stream has been super cozy. Oh, thank you so much. That, that's my goal with these streams. I just love the idea of like, people just being able to clean. <laughs> Learn something and clean, probably. Da, da, da. Plants like Rowan and Blackthorn are offered have offered parts of themselves to me before and others like Gorse have made it clear they don't want to be picked. Are, are these fairy gifts? No, because it's a plant, not a fae. I think there's, there's a lot of crossover and confusion between things. So there are plant spirits, there are nature spirits, there are elementals, there are land whites, there are fae folk. And though they might resemble one another, they're usually not the same thing. So you can have like a plant spirit and a nature spirit residing in the same plant, or you can have like a plant spirit and a fae residing in the same place. So if a rowan or blackthorn and gorse have interacted with you, that's the plant that's interacting with you. So if anything, you would need to look more into, um, especially with rowan and blackthorn, things like tree spirits and plant spirits, because that seems to be something that's really calling to you, the, the plant spirit aspect. And if they're so clear to you, that could really be something that you, you look into further if you haven't already. So I don't think those are fairy gifts. To me, that's the plant that's interacting with you, not a fae. Um, usually the distinction is pretty clear because it the fairy gift literally appears in your house or on your property. It, it's not um, a plant interacting with you. Do, do. Oh, it jumped again. Okay, some of these questions I have already answered like several times in this live stream. So I'm not gonna answer some of them again, but I will take note of them and see if I can make them into a whole video because that might be easier um, just for me to have it all in one place. Do you have friends in the craft? I do, they're kind of dotted all around. Some are um, old coven members, groups that I've been a part of. Some of them are people that I've met at events and shows. Other people are shop owners that I interact with or other people in the craft. So. I have a few dotted around. There's none that I interact with super frequently because I am a solitary practitioner and also I don't get out much. <laughs> but um, I do have friends dotted around here and there. Do you believe that decks are made, wait, do you believe that as decks are made, they get spirits attached to them um, kind of on their own? No, no, the, the decks that I have that have spirits attached to the spirits has been attached afterwards. So this deck, the fairy one, I don't know what's going on with that. <laughs> it, it I, I don't really understand that one. It doesn't feel like a spirit attachment, um, but it doesn't feel like a deck alone either. There's definitely something going on there that I'm mm, not good with. But then I have another deck of cards that specifically has a spirit attached to it. And I know that that spirit was not attached when the deck was made. That spirit came 10 years-ish, I'd say, after the deck was created. And it's it's a spirit that has separately attached itself onto the deck. So like wh when a deck tells me to stop, it's not necessarily that this, there's a spirit in the deck that's telling me to stop. It's that I get to a point where the energy is like my energy, my psychic, connection to that deck of cards is saying, oh, that is a card I need you to see stop. And so it gets you to stop. Whereas there are decks where there's a spirit attached where I will shuffle it and the spirit will be like, hey, hey, stop. <laughs> right now, stop. And so then you have to stop and, and do it that way. So it's kind of two different feelings with it. So you believe that another deck of the same kind wouldn't feel terrible to you. Yeah, I reckon if I were to get the exact same deck as that one, again, which I won't, already doesn't like me for saying that, it's, it's, it's really weird. It's, if anyone knows what I mean when I say it's like the Horcruxes from Harry Potter, where like, it doesn't feel like a spirit, but it's something. 
that's what it feels like. And I, <laughs> I don't think that if I, if, if I were to get the same deck again, I don't think I'd have a problem with it. It's just that one. I have no idea why it's, it's just that one. And other people have used the deck and said the same thing. They've said like, uh, uh-uh, no chance. I'm not using this deck. And I'm like, I know, right? Cause a lot of people will, will think, oh, she's speaking nonsense. Like I've even had friends be like, the deck is fine, give it here. And they hold the deck and they start shuffling and they're like, oh, oh no, <laughs> have it back. Nope. <laughs> so um, yeah, I. it's just weird. I don't really know what's going on with it. It might be a non-human spirit is attached to the deck and that's why it feels so different because my other deck has a human spirit attached to it. That's got its own feel. This deck feels way different. It's really weird. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Mel. So happy to catch you live. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for supporting me in any way. Thank you so much to everyone who likes these live streams and comes to these live streams and sends in a message and all of that. It, it means a lot to me. And I know I say that every time, but it's because I literally don't have any other words that I can use. So thank you so much because you really do help me to keep doing these live streams because I love doing them so much. I have so much fun. That's why they're like three and a half hours long. So um, yeah, thank you so much. Could it be, so th this is about the deck again, is that could it be bad like energies, bad business deal during production? I don't think so. I I don't know what it is. I'll, I'll hold it again. I don't know because like it doesn't feel like energy it feels like more than that like it doesn't when you hold something that's been in a place where there's been lots of bad energy it it doesn't feel like this this is like Oh, I, I actually don't even know how to describe it. It's just this like guttural, you don't want to be touching that kind of a feel. And it makes me like, oh, it makes me feel really weird. So I'm going to put these down. And like, I have had so many different people. Oh, it's making my arm go dead. So many different people hold it and be like, mm -mm, no, no, we're not, we're not dealing with that. And after this, I'm going to go wash my hands and ugh, get that energy off it because nope, 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 nope. I don't know, it was, it was a new deck. So it doesn't feel like it should have any kind of negative emotional attachment to it because it was brand new, like spanking new. It was the first deck that I, I got um, like that because it's a Royal Tarot. It's only the major arcana and it just, oh, out no. Out no, I'm inclined to um, <laughs> saying when you picked up the deck, my dog walked in, looked at my iPad for a split second, and backed straight out of the room. That's the that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Like I will I will take that deck to people, and if they have pets, it's a no go. Like they they will not come into that room. They will not be around it. Psychics, mediums, practitioners, no one wants to be around that deck. So I. Some people are like, burn it. I'm like, no, because if if what I'm thinking is correct and it is a non-human spirit attached to the deck and I burn it, they are going to be so pissed. <laughs> and I am not willing to deal with them being pissed. So the deck stays on the top shelf, out of the way. And, um, oh yeah, I'm gonna go wash my hands with salt water after that. Is it weird that I kind of wish I had something like that so I can actually finally feel energy? Oh, I'm sure you will be able to feel energy at some point, I'm sure. And if you, and maybe this is a good tip for anyone who struggles to feel energy, go into an antique store, practice your energy sensing, like pushing your energy out, drawing it back in again, and go into an antique store because antique stores have the weirdest energy. And you can walk around and different things feel like different energies and like, oh, I I struggle in antique stores because it's 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 a lot. So that could be a good um a good option. 
Generally though, I'd say you don't wanna take an item like that home. I unfortunately didn't feel it before I bought it because I got it online. Foolish decision, I wouldn't recommend. If you're going to get a deck, get it in person if you can, or at the very least, look at the artwork and see how it resonates with you and see how you feel about it. But um, yeah, I got that one and the moment, every time I've used that deck, let's put it this way, every time I've used that deck, I've gotten a nosebleed. And there was one summer where I I tried really hard to use it. This, this is probably 2016, 2015, something like that. I was determined to use it. I was like, I've, I've got this deck, I'm, I've paid for this deck, I have like no money, I need to use this deck. And every time I used that deck, I had a nosebleed and I stopped using the deck at the end of the summer have never had a nosebleed since. And it was the weirdest thing. I, I pick up that deck and I can like feel, I can like feel it in my bones. This is not something I wanna be using. Like, like I keep holding my arm like this and it's cause since I've been shuffling the deck, my arm feels so weird. So um, yeah, I, I'm not destroying that. It's like, yeah, Apple says here, some people don't realize that when you destroy the vessel, the entity can roam anywhere. That's what I mean. I've spoken about it before and I had like dozens of comments being like, just burn the deck, just burn it. And I don't think they realize that like me burning that deck is not gonna stop the entity that's attached to it. At the minute, it's quite content being attached to that deck of cards. If I burn it or do anything with it, it's not going to be happy. Like even dispersing it in ammonia for a day or two, I, I, mm, I'm not dealing with that because if what's attached to the deck is what I think it is, I'm pretty certain that it is a, it feels fey, which makes sense with, with how it feels and how I connect with it. Uh, I'm not dealing with pissing off a whole group of fey that I don't want to piss off. So yeah, maybe I should put it in a glass case. Maybe that's what I should do. Do um do an Annabelle and put it in a glass case and watch me come downstairs one morning and the cards are flipped over. That would be just my luck. <laughs> what sort of results did it give you when you did use it though? Were readings odd at all? They were, as far as I remember, because obviously the last time I used it was like 2015, 2016 actually when 2014 no was it 2014 it might have been 2014 they were not particularly accurate as far as i can remember so i also have the i i got the wild unknown deck which is a full tarot that gives me really really good uh, good readings and um, yeah, I, I was using that at the same time and that would give me great readings. And then I would read this deck and it would give me the strangest readings ever. And now, obviously hindsight, looking back, the cards have kind of a mind of their own. And that was its way of communicating. Um, and it didn't unnerve me at the time because it took me a while to piece together the fact that every time I got a nosebleed, I was using the deck. Like I was actively in the process of using the deck when I would get a nosebleed. So it took me a few months to piece it together, like over the course of a summer. And then by the end of the summer, I was like, oh yeah, hell no. Um, so like I can, I, I can keep the deck, keeping the deck doesn't bother me in any way. And that's the thing is like, I can, banish um, the the objects. Like I, I know how to banish the spirit and I could do it if I wanted to. But to me, that's a whole lot more hassle. You know what I mean? Like I I can do a ritual to banish the spirit from, from the deck, but then I just have to be doing a banishing spell and all the protections following rituals cleansing or two, or I just keep the deck on a top shelf and it is quite content to exist as it is. Like it does not need any interaction from me. It doesn't need energy from me or the surrounding area. It, it, it really just wants to be left alone. So um, best thing for me to do 
is uh, stick it on top shelf. I've done everything else. I, I offerings, asking it, divination with it, pendulum over it, everything. And uh, it's quite content just to sit there. And you know what? I'm quite content for it to just sit there too. It has just become an oddity in my collection. It's just one of my two spirited decks that I own. And um, I'm pretty okay with that because even burying it, the problem is once the vessel breaks down, the spirit is still around. So even burying it um, is uh, not really an option for me. I'll just, I, I, it's bad for me to kind of like it, but I, I kind of like the fact that um, it's just an oddity. <laughs> it, it's just an odd bit of my collection that I just enjoy. Um, in, in, enjoy getting to have. I just don't use it or touch it or interact with it. But it's fun to watch other people freak out about it when they don't believe me. And then I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you read from it then. Give it a go. Because usually people can't even get past shuffling it. Um, they get, they, they like get it out. They hold it. They start shuffling it. They get like five or six shuffles in. And then they're like, oh, no, the furthest anyone's ever got, I think, was putting down one card. So they, they, they shuffled it, they put down one card, and then they just packed it all away. Just literally just packed it all away, stuffed it back in the box, handed it back to me, and was just like, yeah, hell no. <laughs> I'm not dealing with that shit. What if it's something that's trapped within the deck and needs help? It's not. <laughs> it's, it's not. I can tell just by feeling it and I have interacted with it with pendulums before it does not need help it doesn't want help it, if anything it wants everyone everyone to leave it the hell alone um yeah maybe that's what it is Kay. maybe maybe that deck came to me because it knew that I'd leave it alone because like I'm I'm fine with like having it in my collection and I have other decks that I will use um in order to um to get readings, I don't need um, need to use that deck actively. So yeah, I I'm all right. If it's a fae, why don't you wait? If it's the fae, why don't you ask the fae for help? I don't need it to help me. I'm all right with it as it is. <laughs> with you giving the deck so much attention tonight, will it get active tonight? No, it won't. It's it generally just, um, if you aren't interacting with it, like if you aren't touching it, it's fine. It just, for whatever reason, it doesn't like being held. And usually I found that with secondhand decks, this was a brand new deck. Like I got this off eBay and I never do it again because of this experience, but I, um, I don't know. It, it's not like it's a secondhand deck where it's been in a space that's had weird energies. It came straight from a reseller who by the looks of it, didn't do any magical practice themselves. So it's like, I'm, I'm intrigued, but yeah, as a curio, it's pretty cool. But um, it's like, I, I'm, when I was a kid, I was scared of haunted dolls really bad, but now I don't mind having haunted objects in my house because I'm, I feel comfortable in dealing with them now, whereas before I, I never felt comfortable with them. But um, yeah, that's just that's just another one. I have no clue how you guys feel energy through the screen. The energy isn't here, it's there, you know what I mean? That's the thing, a lot of people do, do feel that way with this deck. How do I sense my own energy? How do I know if I'm controlling it? So I have a full video on energy sensing and also centering, grounding and visualization, hopefully combined together, they will be able to help. Oh, I didn't notice this. Thank you so much, Zed. I say Zed, everyone else says Z, but thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. And then there's one here. Oh, bye Phil. Thank you very much for being here. Honestly, actually, thank you to all of my mods for being here because they give up their like precious spare time in order to listen to me waffle. So. Thank you so much, and uh, I really appreciate it. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba -ba. The person who made the cards is probably going through something dark. I mean, that's the thing though, they're made by a machine, aren't they? Like the artwork itself, I can be around the artwork and it's fine, it's just the cards, but then the cards are printed by a machine. So I don't know, 
What is Lieber Knox? So, um, that's kind of a twofold answer. So, Lieber is usually referring to a grimoire. So, you have, like, I have a, um, a book that's called Libra Sigillum. And it's, uh, that one's about the planets, planetary ceremonial magic. And that sounds like, um, I think it derives from Latin. Do I actually have a book called Libra Nox? See, like this one. This one is called Libra Sigillum. Libra Sigillum of the Lords Who Wander. It's all about planetary magic. And usually when you find books that say like Libra something, it's usually a grimoire of something. So like this one goes through like different planets and um, information about them and rituals for them and those kind of things. So it may well be that it is some kind of grimoire. Um, potentially, I don't actually know. Let me see if, do I even have, do I have, is it a book? Why do I recognize this name? Book. I recognize this name and I don't understand why I recognize this name. Oh, oh, <laughs> that's why I recognize this name. Okay, stay right there. Not that you're gonna go anywhere, but either way, it's here somewhere. Lieber Knox by Michael Howard. It's a book. This. That's why I recognise the name. It's a freaking book. So, the tr a traditional which is grimoire. So, Libra usually relates to the word grimoire. Knox is usually knight, typically. And this one is a book on traditional witchcraft or an adaptation of traditional witchcraft. So that might be what you're referring to. Oh, which way? This way? Um, I'm not sure. So you'll have to let me know. But uh, yeah, that's why I recognize the name. I feel like that should have been obvious to me, but this pile is starting to get precarious. Like it's like, it's, it's getting big. <laughs> okay, so energy sensing. So you still struggle to sense your own energy. Okay, so Mm, I'm trying to like quickly come up with a plan. So one thing that we often used to teach people in the group was energy sensing is not really much different from sensing the energy of other things. So when you sense that something is hot or something is cold, you're still sensing energy. It's just a different kind of energy. So if you hold your hand over a radiator, you're gonna feel that heat coming off. There's one technique that we used to do and it's quite a commonplace one. You hold your hands together and you rub your hands together and you're gonna get that like heat energy and kinetic energy. Sorry, it's kind of loud. I hope you can still hear me over it. And then you do this for a while and then you pull your hands apart and you hold them maybe like this far apart. And you can feel that kind of tingly energy. And sometimes you can feel like the desire to like pull your hands apart Oftentimes people want to pull their hands apart. It's kind of like opposite magnets kind of pushing away from one another or coming in together. So by practicing doing this, you get a feel of what that energy might feel like. And you can kind of get it to hold in this space in between. And then you that same feeling is how it feels to sense and control your own energy. So if you're doing say grounding and you're drawing stuff up, it has that same kind of often kind of warm, tingly, heavy feeling as you're drawing it up. And when you're centering yourself, that same feeling is there and you can feel it as you move the energy around yourself, that same kind of staticky warmth often follows as the energy is moving. And I really hope that that helps. I know it's not a great in-depth <laughs> description, but that's what we used to teach people in the group. And it, it often works. I mean, a, a good way of doing it is to do the energy sensing with another person that I've spoken about in the past, but that's tricky if you are just by yourself. But I'm hoping that that at least remotely helps. 
Have you ever been watching a ghost hunter show and see a spirit they can't pick up on any of their equipment and nobody there can sense it? It's happened to me repeatedly. Um, I personally don't get that. Mostly because a lot of the ghost shows are completely staged and there's only a few where I've experienced things like that. The big one is with Most Haunted, which is a British ghost hunting show. It's been going on for years and they are really authentic. Well, besides that one psychic who did lie about demonic possession, but everyone else in the cast and in the team is generally very authentic. And if something isn't there, they're not gonna fake it. And I appreciate that. And in those shows, I've been um, sensing things and, and you do get this gut feeling about things. But in, in lots of other shows, particularly in the American shows, I don't get it because the American shows are a lot. American shows have a lot of like unnecessary creepy music and weird like jittery lighting and like camera movements and like ominous intros. You don't really get that in British ghost hunting shows. I think it's just a different continent thing. <laughs> ah, see, that's the thing though. But if you can do that with the energy sensing, if you can do this, continue practicing it. And then over time, it's gonna get easier and easier and easier. And then it's a case of trying to feel just a little bit of that. You can, you can even start in your hands. You don't even have to start in your core. So you can do this, feel it, and then really focus on that feeling and see if you can move it to the back of your hand and then back to the front of your hand and then the back of your hand and the front of your hand. And it's slow going. Like when I say to people that like the foundational practices of witchcraft take so long, I really mean it because some people can fly through it dead quick. That doesn't mean they're getting it right. Some people really struggle with sensing energies and it takes a long time to get that. And it really is one of those where over time it builds and builds and builds. And in a few months, you might be able to look back and be like, wow, I actually have come a long way and it doesn't feel like it while you're doing it because it is such slow progress. <laughs> I can't differentiate between energies or feeling them in my environment. That is definitely something that comes with time as well. Like being able to differentiate between different things is tricky. And to start off with, often it just all feels like the same. Like you'll hold like different plants or different crystals and you'll feel something, but it just all feels the same. And it's only with time that you get that nuance for how different things feel. So just feeling anything is a really good start, even if it's just from doing this. And what you can do is you can hold that energy. So if you can feel that energy there, hold it and stretch your hands out further and see how long you can hold it before you can't feel it anymore. So like, I can still feel it here like I can still feel it in the gap, but like, and then bring it back in again. And you can like keep it the same or you can expand it or you can condense it. If you can't do it inside just yet, start with your hands and then progress from there. And that way you just need to adapt it to find something that works for you because the same technique is not gonna work for everyone. Some people really, um, f really struggle with doing it internally. They struggle with the centering and grounding. Some people can just feel it outside and it takes a while for them to get it inside. And it's just different people are gonna start in different ways. Some people find one way easier than the other. Um, so yeah, it's kind of where I'm at. I can feel something, but I can't discern one type of energy from another, exactly. Like it, it definitely is this like slow progression. Like to go from not feeling anything to feeling even just something is a massive step. And then the next step up to differentiate it is another massive step up. And it can feel like a mountain to climb, but it is just like a little bit 
every day, you know, just five minutes, just just doing it once every day or, or setting aside like an hour every week just to, just to practice doing that. And over time, you probably won't notice that it's getting any better. But when you look back at how you were before, it's a massive change. So even just keeping a, a list like in your phone, just a note section of like a date, how you felt trying it. The next date, how you felt trying it. And like, instead of constantly comparing yourself, just write it, let it go, write it, let it go. And then in a month, look back and you'll probably be able to see it progressing gradually. You'll see as the listings go down, as the dates go up, you will see improvement and you might not feel it, but when you look back, you can see it. I often get this tingly energy sensation on the top of my head. The best description I have is a tiny lightning bolt zap. Have you ever heard about this phenomena? I know that some people do feel energy in different places. Could be that. Just make sure that it isn't something physical, you know, like certain headaches or migraines or something like that. But different people do store energy in different places. For some people, it naturally goes to their stomach. For some people, it's their throat. For some people, it's their head. For some people, it's their hands. And... Um, that's completely fine. You know, Kay Kayla, I think it's Kayla. Um, so when I sense my energy always wants to naturally go to my hands, is that an issue? Not at all. If you want to center it into your core, that's just something you're gonna have to work on, kind of training yourself to move it back in again. But a lot of people have the opposite problem. They can't get it to their hands. They can get it into their core, like into their central line, but they can't get it out again. So it is just, is the phrase different strokes for different folks? I'm not sure, but anyway, different people are gonna feel it in different places. So some people do feel it a lot here. Some people feel it even lower. Some people feel it up here. Some people feel it in their hands. And if anything, if you feel it in your hands, you actually have an easier time pushing it out because it's already so close to your hands. You just have to make sure that you don't miss the process of training yourself to work that energy if you just automatically start releasing it from your hands, because then you're just skipping all of those steps that you might find really useful later. Is it possible to summon your personal energy to protect against a physical attack from a person, not a spirit? That's a little bit trickier. Mundane always trumps magical. So ideally, you don't want to be in that situation. I understand that you can't always help that. You can use your energy to deter, to make people very uncomfortable. That's something that a lot of people will use, especially if they're walking home from work at night or they're traveling to their car. They will essentially make themselves be surrounded by this icky, awful energy. And anyone that goes to approach will be like, oh God, no, and just walk off. And so that's an option. It's not going to stop anything from harming you physically if that's what they're determined to do. But it is something that can be done just to energetically shield, especially if you're in a situation that you can't necessarily avoid, but you're doing all you can to keep yourself safe in every other way. My class senses is so weird. I feel energy in the weirdest of places. For example, I can feel tingling in my calves or my shoulders when I interact with spirits. Yeah, people do feel it in weird places. When I am holding something high energy, it starts in my hands. The longer I'm holding it, for good or for bad, the longer I'm holding it, the more it creeps up my arms. And if I'm standing somewhere that's really awful, it will naturally like go up my legs. And it's this horrible, like leaded feeling. Like my limbs just feel really heavy. And then when I'm out of that situation, it disappears again. And when I put that object down, it disappears. And it's because I, I've just done it so much where I draw energy in from things. So whether that is a storm, whether that is the electricity in the walls, this is why I'm bad with electrics, I break everything. Um, if it's a crystal or a plant or the earth, I will naturally be drawing up that energy. I have to kind of stop it from being a default. So when I'm in a place or holding something, I will naturally draw in that energy as a way of sensing it. And that isn't always the nicest feeling. So different people will definitely feel it in different ways. Energy makes me feel warm and tingly, but there are times when a tree branch and I got super dizzy. When I asked a tree branch, tree for a branch and got super dizzy, I did not take the branch, but thanked it anyway. Yeah, that is it. Definitely saying, uh-uh, nope, 
not doing it. I get this as well. So the other day I was doing some candles for the market stall and there was this one particular candle that I was spelling and it was just like, oh, whoa, no, that makes me feel horrible. And it's like, it's like the world like tilts and you, you take a step back and you go, okay, I won't do that one. And all of a sudden it's fine again. It is the weirdest feeling. And that is the spirits that I'm working with being like, uh-uh, not today, sweetie. <laughs> We're not doing that today. So um, yeah, it, it's really interesting. And it's nice getting to see and hear from other people in how they experience it and the things that they do. Oh, thank you so much. I'll try my best. I, I know, Marie, that you will get there in the end. I know you will. Um, also, I can feel it more if I continue moving my palms closer and apart. Yes, that's, that's the thing. Sometimes it, it's just about um, shifting it. Because if you, if you hold your hand still, sometimes you kind of can't feel anything. You're just like, it just feels warm. But then when you start shifting it, you're like, whoa, okay, now I can feel it. It's kind of like, the best way I can describe it, at least in my experience anyway, it's like there's a blob of energy right in the middle. And then there's two lines that are coming out from that energy into the center, like right here of my hand. So when you hold it like that, you can't really feel it. But when you stretch your hand apart, it's like the, the, the threads that are attached to my hand, like pull. And I can feel that pulling in the center of my hand. And then when you pull it back in again, the heat gets more the energy is more condensed, but the pulling stops and then I stretch it apart and I can feel the pulling again. It's really weird. Um, yeah, it's really strange. Um, ba -ba, ba -ba, ba -ba. If you ask and feel nothing from a tree, is that a yes or is it better to assume no? Generally, I would say to, I typically assume that it's a yes. Generally, if it's a no, I will very, very strongly feel it as a no. It is very much a <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not doing that. And, um, but if it's a yes, generally it's a, okay, that's fine. Like, okay, it's, it's, it's kind of subtle. It's not like a yes. Whereas when it's a no, it's very much a, don't you dare touch me. It's that kind of a, uh-uh, no. <laughs> so I typically work on the principle of if you ask and don't feel anything either way, it's fine. If it's a, you ask and you feel it and it's really strongly a no, then it's definitely a no. Um, I usually don't get a really strong yes unless I'm curious as to what kind of plants I should use and then one will like scream out to me yes and then I know that it's it's a yes. How many types of magic are there? Um, I mean an infinite amount because it, it's not, it, it's, a, it's energy, right? So how you use it is gonna vary. And that's what is considered like a type of practice. So there's thousands, tens of thousands of different varieties of practice, but they're still working with the same energy. And that's pretty much the easiest way I can describe it. It's obviously a little bit more complicated than that, but yeah, that's about as easy as I can get to explaining it. When it comes to, so this question is about communicating with um, passed over spirits. When it comes to anything, um, whether they are people that you have lost or pets that you have lost, I would typically recommend waiting till you have fully grieved or, or grieved as much as, as you can before trying communication. And that's mostly so that you are able to better process, you're able to fully grieve that situation without using communication as a crutch. Because what can often happen is that when you can communicate, you don't process. And then you never truly process. So I, I would recommend before anything that you would grieve as much as you can, process everything that, that you need to process. And then you can do communication through 
pendulums, dreams. I mean, dreams are usually a good idea for pets. It's, it's a good way to get their connection to come through easily through meditations, those kind of things. So when it comes to different types of um, of practice, I mean, there's there's anything that there's uh, green witchcraft, there's hedge witchcraft, hearth witchcraft, uh, elemental magic, ceremonial magic. There's many different traditions around the world, um, many of which I know probably nothing about. And witchcraft is just one small um, fraction of that. It's just a tiny drop in the ocean compared to all of the magical traditions around the world. And the way they do things is going to vary, very dramatically vary, or just, I should have just gone with varies, is going to vary depending on the tradition they're a part of. So how they interact with that energy is going to be different. How they utilize that energy is going to be different. and they But they're going to be using it in order to gain knowledge or assistance or to manifest change. The way they do it, though, it is going to be drastically different. Is singing and feeling it vibrate harmonically the same energy? I don't know. I think it's going to depend on how energy feels to you. For me, that's not how energy feels. Um, but that is definitely a very individual thing. Okay, so communication wise, how do they communicate with us? Do you believe they go on to another life after they pass away? If yes, and how can they talk to us at all? See, this is a very personal thing. So it's gonna depend on your belief system. Some people believe in heaven. Some people believe in reincarnation. Some people believe in Summerland. Some people don't believe in an afterlife at all. And so there's no one answer to, to it. It really is going to depend on how you feel about the afterlife. So for many people, they believe that a part remains, the part that we maybe remember or that we grieve over or the part of them that is still living within us, that's still a part of them, even if them spiritually is gone. We are still interacting with them, but it's an echo of them. Whereas other people believe that it is them that it is their spirit whereas other people believe that they are communicating from an afterlife there's there's really no definitive answer on it because we really don't know like if if we are living we don't know what happens and we don't really know how it works we just know that some people do communicate with the dead via necromancy and that's just really all we know about it so for me it's it's difficult because I've had so many interactions with spirits that there are some spirits that I know that I can interact with, but there are others that I can't. And is that because they're elsewhere or is that because they can't interact? That entirely varies, I suppose. Do you have any experience with singing in spells or ritual? I like music a lot and want to incorporate it more in my practice. Yeah, so I will do chanting in my spell work and ritual. And I find that to be really useful and really enjoyable. I really enjoy music. I struggle when it's external music because I have a tendency to get distracted by it. Anything with lyrics in it, I get distracted by. So I will typically stick to no music or ambient music. And then any additions on top of that are just fun. And I enjoy it and I enjoy it. And it gets me in kind of that, that headspace for it. So it has been nearly four hours, I am losing my voice. So I think I'm gonna call it for tonight. If you have any last minute questions, feel free to post them and I will try to kind of quick fire answer any more that anyone has, though quick fire might be a little bit of an exaggeration for me considering it's me and uh, I can talk for hours, <laughs> like actual hours. So, Yes. Thank you very much for everyone who has been here. Um, would you give offerings or develop an ancestor practice to get in love, to get in love? It's because I saw the hearts to get in touch with a pet that's passed on. You definitely can. Yeah. So you can leave offerings of treats or food that they really enjoyed, those kind of things. Those are all completely good offerings, especially for pets. So yeah, thank you so much for being here. If 
you do enjoy these videos, if you could like them, I would really appreciate it. It lets YouTube know that you like them and will let people know when I go live because I know that a lot of people um, don't see when I go live because YouTube doesn't tell them. So I would really appreciate that. If you have any further questions, I do live streams like this every month. I'm hoping that next time it will be better timed. Um, usually they are the Wednesday after the 15th. So that would be maybe um, the 21st, but, oh, Yule, nice. It might be Yule, um, but that really all depends. So I'll post it at least a few hours beforehand when I'm going to go live. So yeah, thank you so much for tonight. And um, I will talk to you guys in the next video, which hopefully, hopefully will be up this weekend. No, it's not, it's gonna be up on Wednesday. It's going to be a reaction video because I've edited it. I was meant to post it last week and then I didn't. So it's a reaction video and then I have a conquer video coming out afterwards. So yes. Okay, I'm gonna have to go now, otherwise I'll be here all night. But thank you so, so much, everyone. I really, really appreciate you. And I will see you in the next video. Okay, bye.